So if everyone is, um, if all the arrangements are in place, I will start. Okay, so hi everyone. Hello and welcome to the, uh, the newest of the Friends of Socialist China webinars entitled The Empire Strikes Back imperialism's global war on multipolarity. My name is Radhika Desai and so I- if everyone is, um, if all the arrangements are in, sorry, my bad. Uh, right, so to continue, uh, my name is Radhika Desai and I'm speaking to you from Winnipeg in Canada. We are discussing this theme of imperialism's war on multipolarity just when the war that the U.S. has instigated against Russia over Ukraine is grinding on, raising prospects of famine, inflation, fewer shortages, and even possibly nuclear war uh, in a wider conflagration. Um, meanwhile, the U.S. president continues to make one irresponsible and dangerous remark after another, indicating that the United States, perhaps because it is desperate, perhaps because it is uh, uh, rather less, uh, is, might be going for some sort of maximalist aims, uh, which can only spell uh, a danger and, and, and destruction for the world. And this includes uh, the Biden administration making threatening remarks uh, to China, uh, threatening a similar scenario uh, of, of a war against China over Taiwan this time on the model of the Ukraine conflict. So this, these are clearly dangerous times. These are clearly difficult times. And it is important perhaps to begin with some basics. What is multipolarity and why should we care about it? Well, at a very minimum, it refers to the fact that today around the world, productive power and along with it, all the other forms of power have spread sufficiently widely to essentially displace the West and the United States from their previous centrality to the world order. And I'd like to mention that I'm particularly partial to Hugo Chavez's preference for the term pluripolarity, indicating that these a larger number of poles of power around the world also are distinct. They have distinct traditions, they have distinct ways of managing their economy, uh, distinct institutions through which to do this, distinctive needs and desires and aspirations. So why is it then that we should defend this sort of multipolarity or pluripolarity? I can think of at least three reasons. The first and foremost, perhaps the most important, is that it undermines imperialism. It has historically done so. And today it is undermining a particularly dangerous and desperate U.S. imperialism. More, uh, the, the mainstream uh, press and the main, mainstream scholarship only began paying attention to multipolarity in the 2010s. But if you think about it, multipolarity, that is to say there being multiple poles of productive power is more than a century old. It goes back at least to the late 19th century when uh, the first challenges emerged to, to challenge the dominance of uh, the industrial and imperial dominance of Britain over the world. And uh, all of these challenges actually were based on uh, uh, organizing economies uh, in a state-directed fashion, in a protectionist fashion. I don't want to use the word protectionist in a bad way, but in a way that implies managing trade intelligently to ensure high levels of economic activity, high levels of technological advance, and so on. The, this was the way in which these challenges emerged then and continue emerging today. So, Precisely because the world had already become multipolar in the late 19th century that the United States has always failed in its efforts to try to unite the cap uh, unite a world under capitalism and under its domination, because of course no sooner had these original challenges emerged you also starting in 1917 had the Soviet Union and in 1949 China pursuing their own forms of development and therefore enhancing multipolarity. So uh, in that sense, um, 
uh, the, the United States essentially was constrained in its attempt to dominate the world. And after the demise of the Soviet Union and the end of communism in Eastern Europe, it briefly looked as though the United States would have its way, it would establish its dominion in a sense over the world. But it, by the new century, it was very clear that this was not possible. The United States on the one hand, in its attempt to dominate the world had become too weak economically. And on the other hand, uh, the Soviet Union may have gone, but Russia was being stabilized and China in particular was making huge strides in its economic, in its socialist economic development. And so this has continued the onward march of multipolarity. So that's the first reason. The second reason is that multipolarity is all about development. Free markets, free trade, free market globalization, and free market US hegemony do not and have never produced development. They have only offered the rest of the world subordination to imperialism. It's only state managed and directed development that subordinates markets to the public purpose, to social ends that have ensure development. And this has become clear in the new century and to more and more people, countries around the world, in Latin America, in Africa and elsewhere, are beginning to realize that free market, free trade, neoliberal way is not going to give them development. They have to try something else. And the final very brief reason is that multipolarity by spreading productive and along with it military power around the world is, is the only force capable of deterring, if possible, and preventing the United States from waging its unending wars that it has kept up since the demise of the Soviet Union. So I think for all these reasons, multipolarity is very critical. So having recalled those basics, let's turn to our fantastic set of panelists who are going to talk about many, many different aspects of this very general uh, uh, phenomenon that we have identified. As we go on, I'm going to introduce them in turn, and each speaker will speak for about 12 minutes. Um, uh, uh, some of the speakers have sent recordings, and I should uh, apologize both to our Chinese speakers and to the audience for one uh, a design flaw. Since we are starting so late in the day, uh, since it's already 11 p.m. in China, we have decided that we are going to have all the speakers based in China first, and then we'll have all the other speakers. So apologies for that lopsidedness, but I think it will still be a really great event. So. Uh, our first speaker is Victor Gao. Uh, Victor is vice president of the China uh, for the Center of China and Globalization and chair professor of, of Suzhou University and the chairman of China Energy Security Institute. He has extensive experience in government diplomacy, securities regulation, uh, uh, legal, uh, uh, legal experience, in, uh, experience in investment banking, corporate management, and the media. Victor was Deng Xiaoping's English interpreter in the 1980s, and he's also a licensed attorney at law in the state of New York. So Victor, we are very eager to hear what you have to say. Uh, please go ahead, Victor. No, turn, turn on your mic. Turn on your mic. Okay. Is my mic on? Hello? Yes. Ah, okay. Thank you, Radhika. Good evening, everyone. It is my great pleasure to attend this very important webinar. Um, I think uh, uh, we are truly at a crossroad in terms of geopolitics, international politics, mm -hmm. Uh, economic trade, uh, all these very important things. And it is really time for us to stop and pause and to reflect as to what exactly uh, is the mega trend that we are going through. I think the world today is truly in great turmoil. Uh, we see the military operations in Ukraine on the one hand. We see NATO being fully mobilized to deal with this war in Ukraine. And we also see, ironically, that the United States is finger pointing at China, saying that while their attention is focused on the Ukrainian war, China, according to the United States, is the biggest uh, challenger and the enemy of the United States. It doesn't seem to make any sense. Allow me to make one point. I think from the U.S. perspective, if it aims to treat Russia on the one hand and China on the other hand as enemies, 
then this probably will be the worst that the United States will be faced with in dealing with geopolitics in the world of today. Then on the other hand, if we compare China and Russia, uh, even though they had a lot of uh, same uh, common roots before, uh, China and Russia today are very, very different countries in almost all aspects that you can think about. So it is amazing that the United States is very eager to put both China and Russia into the same category, what they call autocracies, vis-a-vis uh, -vis democracies, as they call it. Now, allow me to make several observations. I think from the Chinese perspective, in terms of the political system we are pursuing, we call it socialism with Chinese characteristics. Now, this is very, very important. You may recall that um, before 1978, China probably achieved the highest level of egalitarianism in human history, but it was egalitarianism of poverty. In China at that time, everyone was equal, but everyone was equally poor. And then Deng Xiaoping came along and he basically said poverty should not be the characteristic of socialism. Socialism as a political system should generate wealth and uh, a good quality life for the people. And then he need to figure out what's the way out of this huge ideological box that China was putting uh, at the end of the 1970s. Now, what he proclaimed was this socialism with Chinese characteristics. So ever since Deng Xiaoping, China has been focusing on economic development. Development has become the hard truth, and in my term, the soft truth, as well as the smart truth. And I think through development, China has completely transformed itself. Now, by the end of last year, 2021, China's economy, if we use uh, official exchange rates, is already about 80% of that of the United States. But if we use purchasing power parity, the Chinese economy is already about 130% of that of the United States. And in key categories, for example, production of iron and ore, cement, concrete, you name it, it's more than 300 different items, major items, China's production is not only much larger than that of the United States. In many cases, China's production accounted for more than 50% of the global production. So in a sense, I think people need to think about what has generated so much productivity and efficiency in the way that China is dealing with economic development. You know, whether there is any secret recipe, for example, whether whatever China is following has some generality that other countries can also uh, think about or take reference from, for example. And I think uh, this is truly a very best perspective. They claim that China's transformation was because China stole technologies from the United States. China forced the American companies to move from the United States offshore to China, etc. So you hear a lot of horror stories from the mouths of former President Trump, his followers, etc. Even in the administration of the Biden administration, you still hear a lot of these horror stories, is that right? However, I would say China has never forced any American company or developed countries' companies at gunpoint to force them to relocate to China. I think all these Western companies come to China voluntarily to seek profit, not for China, but for their own shareholders. And in this process, they really contributed to globalization. And China, of course, benefited from that. But the key for China was that at the end of the 1970s, Deng Xiaoping led China onto the path of economic development, focusing on growth, focusing on Chinese characteristics, therefore enabling China to seize upon whatever that worked, whatever that contributed to increasing productivity and efficiency. And as a result, we are where we are today in China as the second largest economy in the world, as an economy larger than that of the United States by purchasing power parity. And then in less than another 10 years, the Chinese economy will be uh, larger than that of the United States if we use purchasing power parity as the benchmark. 
And it is generally expected that by the middle of this century, that is around 2050, for example, the Chinese economy probably will be double the size of that of the United States. So we need to figure out what's the secret recipe. It's not uh, stealing from the United States. It's not in uh, President Trump's term, raping America, for example, it is something that really has worked for China. I would emphasize several points. One is that maintaining domestic stability, because we know for sure that if you cannot maintain your stability, if you cannot put your own house in order, there is no development you can talk about. Now, the other thing is to maintain peace or keeping peace in the world. That doesn't mean that China has the ability to dictate peace for many countries in the world, which may be involved in conflicts of all kinds, but it means that China, to the extent possible, want to promote peace rather than engaging war and want to stay away from using war as a means to achieve state-to-state -state, uh, objectives. Now, this is very important because if you see what has happened to China, uh, ever since the end of the 1970s, China has never been involved in the war except border clashes with Vietnam at the end of the 1970s and in the 1980s. Ever since then, the Chinese People's Liberation Army has never been involved in the real battle or war and has not fired a single shot outside of China. This is very important. China is the only member of the permanent member of the Security Council of the United Nations, which has not fought an active war abroad uh, or engaged in military operations of one kind or another abroad over the past several decades. Now, the other thing is really treating development as the only thing that matters. Deng Xiaoping said, development is the hard truth. And I've added onto that. I said development is not only the hard truth, but the soft truth as well as the uh, smart truth. Because imagine if China was still, is still weak as it was in 70, 1978, how could you hear any politician in the United States without talking about China whenever they open their mouth? They are now seized upon China. Why? Because they realize that they are faced with one phenomenon that they are not come across for more than 100 years. That is, they need to deal with a country which is larger as an economy than the United States, which has greater growth momentum than that of the United States. And I hope the American decision makers will sooner or later come to terms with this imminent prospect, and then soon will be reality that they need to deal with. Now, from the Chinese perspective, we do not view the United States as an enemy. We do not view the American people as our enemies. We are very eager to get along with the United States as a country and with the American people. However, on the other hand, while we truly put a value on the current international order headed by the United Nations, and we believe that all countries, big or small, need to be treated as equal, we really do not want to be dictated by terms spelled out by other countries, for example, by the United States. Now, the United States now is accusing China as uh, wrecking the values in the world or wrecking the international order. Allow me to emphasize one point. China really does not export ideology or political system or values. Why? Because we truly believe that every country, every nation, every civilization has its own claim to possess and develop, develop its own culture, its own civilization. I think we, we really need to follow the philosophy that your God is for you and my God is for you. Don't try to impose your God on me. And I will really uh, bring myself to great peril if I try to impose my God to you. So China is not trying to impose its political system onto any other country, and to say the least, upon the United States. Now, if we look at the world from the Chinese perspective, this is truly a multilateral world, because we do not want to live in a world to be dictated by the United States. 
And we do not want to live in a world to be dictated by China, for example. I remember back in 1974, when Deng Xiaoping, before his downfall and bouncing back, for example, he made an important speech at the United Nations in New York. He said, China will never be a superpower. If China wanted to be a superpower, he appealed on countries in the world to unite, to overthrow China as the superpower. Because in the Chinese philosophy, to be a superpower or to be a hegemon is a bad thing because it involves imposing your will onto other countries. So I think we are in a multilateral world. We need to respect each other. And allow me to emphasize another point. Now, as far as China-US relations are concerned, I think if any country tries to deprive the Chinese nation of their right of economic development, this probably will be the largest crime against humanity in history. So I think we need to respect every country's right to economic development. And if you gain more or I gain more, etc., normally it should be normal. I think we need to be objective about that rather than politicize such trade issues or economic relations, for example. And I think when China is faced with this maximum pressure upon the, uh, upon the country by the United States uh, and the trade, the tariff war has expanded to trade war of all kinds, technology war and uh, ideology war, geopolitical war of all kinds. And then when we look at the world from the Chinese perspective, we are really facing a moment of truth. That is war or peace. We want to embrace peace. We do not want to be involved in war. And I hope we will really be united to present our case to the international community to emphasize how important peace is and how important multilateral, multilateralism is, and how important that we need to really rally uh, behind the United Nations and treating each country as equal, rather than any country has impunity to impose its will, its values, its system onto other countries. Allow me to add another point. China has been promoting this Chinese dream for more than a decade now, and when we talk about Chinese dream, lots of people also mention the American dream. Now, I would say on a personal level, the Chinese dream and the American dream overlap to a large extent because we do want to have you know, better education. We want to send our kids to a better school. We want to have better medical care, for example, nursing care eventually. Uh, to a large extent, it's very similar. But on the state-to-state -state level, it's very, very different. China respects all the countries as an equal. And I think the United States does not want to do that. I always say the United States is worried that they do not have enough enemies, whereas China is always worried that we do not have enough friends. So I think it is time for us to promote friendship, good neighborhood, and uh, uh, peace, for example, development. And if we focus on development, then between China and the United States, it's not a zero-sum game. China can really lend a very important hand in helping the United States to build up its infrastructure, for example, to build up its supply chains, and uh, to make sure there are more better jobs in the United States. Because we truly believe that by promoting trade and economic relations, it is not a win for one country. It normally is a win-win situation for countries involved in normal trade with each other. I will stop here for the moment. I want to emphasize that I'm a true believer in multilateralism. And I want me and my future generations to live in a world with multilateralism where countries and cultures of all kinds should be dealt with as equals, rather than we allow any country to dictate its terms onto the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Victor. That was really great. So sort of giving us an overview of, of uh, China's development as well as its very, very different way of conducting itself in the world while the United States pursues imperialism, superpower politics. China is, is pursuing politics of 
international politics of mutual benefit and mutual gain, while the United States wants to impose its so-called rules-based international order, China upholds the United Nations. One could go on, but thank you very much, Victor. That was great. Our thank next you, speaker. Yeah, our next speaker is Li Jingjing. Uh, Jingjing is a reporter with uh, uh, CGTN or China Global Television Network. She has traveled throughout China doing English language video journalism. And you should watch her videos, they are really great. She provides the outside world with a ground level view of life, particularly in the autonomous regions and among ethnic minorities. Jingjing has interviewed uh, Uyghur Islamic scholars in Xinjiang and school children in Tibet. She spent February and March 2020 in Wuhan, covering China's COVID frontline for CGTN. Um, her talk show, Talk It Out with Li Jingjing, is something of a social media sensation with 2.5 million followers on Facebook. Uh, Jingjing, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Radhika. Thank you for your kind words and your introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Li Jingjing. I'm a journalist from China. It's such a great honor to be here and to be among all the speakers whose work I've been following closely for a really long time. So I'm a Chinese born and raised in China. Uh, I've traveled extensively across China, covered extensively on subjects that the West allegedly really concerned about, uh, like Xinjiang, like COVID situation, and subjects that the West doesn't seem to really care about, like such as eliminating poverty. So today I hope to bring some aspects of those issues that are rarely being reported by Western mainstream media and their rising anti-China propaganda during this particular era. So in his latest speech at the Stanford University, former US President Barack Obama said something, something very interesting. He said, it's not necessary for people to believe this information in order to weaken democratic institutions. You just have to flood a, a country's public square with enough raw sewage. You just have to raise enough questions uh, spread enough dirt, plant enough conspiracy theorizing that citizens no longer know what to believe. Once they lose trust in their leaders, in mainstream media, in political institutions, in each other, in the possibility of truth, the game is won. So when he said those in the speech, he actually meant other people, other politicians are doing this to the United States. But man, feels like he was speaking from experience because that's exactly what the United States has been doing to the rest of the world the entire time with their media, with the NGOs, with the separatists, they found it worldwide. Throwing dirt, throwing conspiracy theories, negative information, sponsoring separatists and cover revolutions and eventually lead to a regime change that bring chaos to the country in the name of defending human rights of, of freedom. And they are taking those away from the people in those regions. So people, we need to look through their hypocritical faces and how some governments are giving themselves the most seemingly most righteous justifications to do the most horrendous crimes towards people in other regions. For example, look at all the dirt and raw sewage they threw at China first. Some people from the West, who have never heard about the terms like Xinjiang or Uyghurs two years ago, suddenly became really concerned about the human rights of Uyghurs or Muslims in Xinjiang now. First, governments with the worst records of murdering Muslims directly and indirectly across the world suddenly really care about the human rights of Muslims in Xinjiang. Isn't that suspicious? Why do they only care about Muslims in China? Besides, where were they when the innocent, peace-loving Muslims and Uyghurs were murdered by radicalized extremists on the streets several years ago when terrorism was still ravaging, ravaging China? So now, when there are finally zero terrorist attacks, when two million Uyghurs were lifted out of poverty, when Uyghurs can earn much more income, have better access to education, when their life is much more stable, the Western government suddenly jump out to say, oh, I care so much about your human rights. So I'm not buying anything you make. Actually, I'm also forbidding anyone to buy anything you make. Make you unemployed shows how much I care about your human rights. 
So all the, fa all the facts show the population, all the facts, all the data show the population of Uyghurs is actually growing. The economic situation of the whole Xinjiang is much, much better than before. And there are more mosques in Xinjiang than even than many Muslim majority countries. But still, the Western governments continue to throw sanctions on products made in Xinjiang. And those sanctions are not about reducing forced labor. What they're really doing is making locals unemployed, hoping them to suffer financially and creating instability in China. I've done, I've made tons of videos showing the footage, the interviews of the people of all walks of life in Xinjiang. So I won't elaborate here since we have limited time. Anyone who is interested in knowing more about this subject, feel free to check out my YouTube channel. My YouTube channel is the same name of mine, Li Jingjing. So I and several independent journalists have spoken out on this subject and also on the background of uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis as well. And what we did is just providing the data, the background, the voices, the different sides of the stories that were never reported by Western mainstream media or politicians. And you would think that since they care about the human rights of people in China or in other countries, they want to hear it. No. In the past few months, people like me and actually also several other guests at this, uh, at this panel, at this webinar, we got attacked by these media, mainstream media, like the New York Times, like the Associated Press. And instead of debating with us on the facts that we provided, this media immediately jumped out, attacking us, uh, putting labels on us, hoping to fewer people would hear what we say. I mean, on YouTube channel, I don't have a larger following, only 24,000 followers. But that small number is already big enough for both the NYT and AP to write about my channel, to write about me and hope my channel to be banned. And that shows how little tolerance they have towards any voice that speaks anything positive about China or, or any other country on their enemy list. And that shows how little tolerance they have towards the people that have different opinions from their China bad narratives. Um, but I also want to point out how weak, how double standard their argument is. Because one talking point they've always used to attack me or discredit me is that I work for a state-owned company. Hence, my voice is not trustworthy. I am working for a state-affiliated media, the CGTN, right now. And I've never hidden it from anyone. All my followers know very well what I do, what, who I work for, and that's one of the reasons they follow my channel. I'm, and I'm not even trying to ask people to blindly, fully believe whatever I say. What I do is just to bring people the stories, the voices that are neglected by Western mainstream media, let people to see different sides of the story so they can decide what to believe, come to a conclusion themselves. If after watching my videos, you still don't believe me, fine, that's your conclusion. But while they're attacking me as a state affiliate media, they have no problem believing and amplifying individuals and ins institutions that are funded by the US government. So most of the reports and allegations about Xinjiang come from this one think tank, Australian Strategic Policy Institute or ASPI. This so-called think tank is actually funded by multiple governments, including the US State Department, UK Embassy in China, UK Embassy in Canberra, US Department of Defense, the Embassy of Japan, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's, the, it's all on their website. You can find it on ASPS website. So I'm not making this up. It's actually funded by multiple governments and the military industrial complex. And so are many individuals and organizations who are separatists. But these Western mainstream media have no problem believing and amplifying their voices when they are quoting those people using the research done by those institutions. These media didn't for a minute have any problem with their multi multiple governments funded background. So isn't that double standard? That's about Xinjiang. And let's talk about Hong Kong too. The West is so concerned about the human rights and freedom in Hong Kong, right? In Hong Kong, as they are. But you know how many people told me that they were strongly, many people from Hong Kong that when I went there, 
uh, many people, local Hong Kongers told me that, that they're actually very strongly against what the protesters did. They're actually rioters. Rioters were destroying their city, ruining their daily life, yet they couldn't speak up because once the rioters know what they look like and they dare to disagree with the rioters, the rioters would physically attack and threat them and their family members, putting their family members information uh, public online so they can cyber, cyber bully them too. And you know how many people were actually seeing how violent, how ridiculous some rioters were in front of their homes. And then when they go back home, turn on the TV and saw completely different things being reported by Western mainstream media. So why weren't the West concerned about those people's human rights? Why your media and puppets, your sponsored, don't give any freedom of speech to those Hong Kong people? So I think the West's propaganda skill is indeed outstanding because if you think about it, if you look at the history, they are the ones that committed so many atrocities across the world towards every region, every race. They are the ones that built their wealth by looting from the rest of the world. And they are still able to make themselves look like the beacon of democracy, make every evil deed they do look righteous. And yet they can make a country like China that is rising peacefully look like the evil one. So every country that has a different system or refuses to be bullied by the West look like the evil one. And that's one hell of propaganda. So now when the global South is united, when Africa, Latin America, the West Asia are having more economic ties with China, having a better relationship with China, instead of reflecting what they have done wrong to those regions, were coming out with a better offer to compete, They'd rather just spend the money on creating negative news about China in those regions. Uh, I'm going to share my screen quickly to show you some, some news on my uh, desktop. Okay. So are you guys seeing my screen? So this is a reporter from the Herald, a newspaper in Zimbabwe. This is Look at the title, US plan to discredit Chinese investment unmasked. So they found out the United States is sponsoring a strategy to undermine Chinese investment in Zimbabwe. By smearing, China's, Chinese companies are engaging in widespread labor malpractices, as well as violation of human, community, and environmental rights, among other ills. So this is the report. You, you, if, um, you can Google it later. So they find these people, uh, United States through the US embassy in Zimbabwe is training independent journalists to particularly write negative news about Chinese companies, about Chinese investments. One source said the training of journalists by the US embassy is feeding into wider activities by Western countries to equip the media, civil society, and legal fraternity to fight the influence and growth of China in Zimbabwe. The weaponizing anti-Chinese sentiment, as well as exploiting economic vulnerabilities of journalists. So there's a long article and there's another one. On the Herald, newspaper in Zimbabwe, US, CCC, and local journalists gone up to foment chaos. So they are sponsoring local journalists to write negative stories at the same time, undermining Chinese investment. And actually they are organizing some protests. They're scheduling an anti-government, anti-Chinese demonstrations that have been scheduled from May 26. See, the local journalists find out this is what the United States is doing. Instead of spending the money on some useful things, they are just creating negative news on Chinese investment. I remember a joke that is told by my friend, Daniel. He said, um, the United States is like your jealous neighbor when he sees you build a swimming pool in your yard. Instead of building his own, he decided to take a dump in yours. <laughs> so when see you're rising, you're rising economically. Okay, let's like, <laughs> let's talk bad about him. So, so they are trying to put others down to keep themselves strong. 
So I think it's time for the West to reflect itself. You are not the center of the world. The global South has more population than the West. You can no longer tell people in global South what to do. Countries like China or countries in Africa, in Latin America, in West Asia, the rest of the world can decide what to do based on what's in the best interest for them. And I will end my speech with a few minutes of a speech from a retired colonel from the United States in terms of the threats of China or Russia that the West is so scared of. So I'm gonna share my screen again. Here it is. This is a retired Colonel Richard Black, former head of the US Army Criminal Law Division at the Pentagon. So he works for the interests of the United States, not for the interests of China or Russia. And this is what he said about the illusion that the military industrial complex created. And let me just point out the illusion of Russian and Chinese aggression around the world. You hear this repeated many, many times that Russia is going to take over the entire world. China is taking over the world. They're doing all this stuff. If you look at the, uh, the number of foreign bases between the U.S. and the U.K., we have about 900 overseas military bases, bases where we have troops uh, stationed in foreign countries. The total bases of the, the Russians and the Chinese, about 35. China only has five overseas bases compared to the 900 or so US, UK. We've created this bizarre illusion because the war industrial complex must have enemies. You cannot manufacture weapons when you don't have enemies. And so we create this illusion that they're coming to get us, they're, all, they're on our doorstep. And the fact of the matter is that China is out to make a buck. They want money. Uh, they, yes, they, they, the, the Belt and Road Initiative is very important, but they have a different paradigm. Our paradigm is we, we go into a country, we set up uh, NGOs, uh, we take over you know, the government by coup, if we can't, then we just, we just bomb the place to smithereens half the time. And you compare that with the, with the foreign policy of China, which is you go in, you work with whatever government is there, you don't, you don't, you're not judgmental, but you make hard business decisions, you make investments. And uh, I think for people who are comparing the foreign aid paradigm of, of the U.S. and China, they're saying, you know, uh, my, my, uh, my likelihood of surviving is much higher if I follow the Chinese paradigm. We need to just get away from this feeling that we have to constantly be at war with the entire world. We've got... Okay, the full video is like four minutes long, so I want to play the full video here. So anyone interested, you can find it, Google it on YouTube or on Twitter. And... This is my speech. I hope you'll like it. And thank you so much, Radhika. I'm looking forward to your other speaker's speech. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jingjing. Jing. That was really a fantastic insight into the real workings of American propaganda, the ideological war and the propaganda war that it is waging against nearly all the countries in the world because that's they want to dominate nearly all the countries in the world. So, uh, well, some of us, like in Canada, we, we are very willing to be dominated, so we don't get the bad propaganda. <laughs> so anyway, um, our next speaker is uh, Ding Yifan. Uh, Yifan is a senior fellow at the Taihe Institute, vice chairman of the China Society for World Economics, and vice chairman of the China Society for France Studies. He was previously deputy director of the Institute for World Development under the State Council's Development Research Center. Uh, Ding has uh, authored several books on globalization, international finance, dollar hegemony, Sino-European relations, and other topics. So I'm sure he's going to have a very interesting perspective on our topic today. So uh, Ding Yifan, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aaron and Radhika. 
So it's a pleasure to be invited to, to talk a little bit about today's uh, group flex. Right, I will share my PPT with you. Uh, that's some, a, a simple analysis of today's world and how uh, the, the, the danger comes uh, really from. So, well, other countries would like to embrace a multipolar world in the post Cold War period and a multilateral framework of international coordination mechanisms to deal with global issues. The United States want to take advantage of its position as a sole superpower to impose its own way of life. Think about the end of history. The end of history told us that that's the, the, the peak of human history. So human will all become Americans some way. Show the strength by waiting. That's why uh, after this, the story about the end of history, uh, those uh, predominant propagandists uh, in the United States uh, tried to promote their model, and then they tried to wage several wars uh, to show their muscles. So uh, in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, and Syria. But unfortunately, these wars, instead of helping the U.S. ensure its predominance globally, did deplete its fiscal capability. So, to some extent, it's a paradox that on one hand, the US wanted to maintain its predominance uh, globally and to take advantage of, uh, of its uh, status as the only superpower, as the only hegemon in the international system to maintain the, its position. But on the other hand, the way it tried to maintain its predominance has completely depleted its fatal power. So today's threat is the more the U.S. is grasping at its declining hegemony, while its fixed position cannot afford to do so, the more it will be tempted to instigate wars in other regions of the world in order to present itself as the only safe harbor of international investment. That's how I think that those capitalists try to manage things uh, in the world and with regard to the United States. So, so I just uh, uh, wanted to talk about with these three topics. War as an instrument to show the US military muscles. Uh, the second point is a double edged sword. So, this behavior is the double sword because that will deplete the fiscal revenues of the United States, aggravating uh, the economy recession and financial crisis. The last, uh, uh, the US is sowing discord in other regions, in other countries, uh, that's the modern version of divide and rule. So that if we talk about imperialism, it's back, it's that, that the, the divide and rule is an instrument used by the, the old imperialist countries in the world. So war is an instrument to show you as military muscle. So interest group is behind the wars. <laughs> we know that military industrial contacts are very interested in promoting war in other countries. And that, but unfortunately, uh, those wars has depleted uh, a lot of fiscal, uh, fiscal capability of the United States without ensuring even a minor war in Afghanistan, for example, a small country in the world. So in Afghanistan, they spent so many money. They spent so many money. Uh, they have completely depleted uh, US fiscal powers for nothing, for nothing. Iraq war also, they spent so many in Iraq while well, uh, created uh, some uh, monsters like, uh, like ISIS, uh, Islamic State, all these things. And then they, they provoked also Libya war and just the top of uh, a regime that was in cooperation with Western world, while currently in all these regions, uh, they, those regions has become really uh, uh, a warm bait of the internet terrorism, although uh, for some time it calms down now. 
Syria war, Syria is a still in war, uh, and uh, Syria has become a, a dispute of these geopolitical powers in, in the region because we don't know how it will end up. So, and the second problem is the double edged sword. Double edged sword is depletion of fiscal revenues, aggravating economic recession and the fiscal crisis. Let's have a look at these things. I remember that in uh, 2007, when uh, the subprime bubble burst. So in the United States, there is a, a imminent, imminent uh, uh, financial crisis in 2000, uh, really with uh, uh, Lehman Brothers uh, go bankrupt. Uh, 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 financial tsunami comes to the United States first. And then that cross over the Atlantic Ocean to reach Europe. And then uh, the whole world has been involved into an uh, international financial crisis. So in, in 2007, uh, Hank Paulson wanted to uh, bail out the US financial system. So she begged uh, Nancy Pelosi, who used to be the uh, spokeswoman of the uh, US Congress, uh, for uh, 700 billion US uh, dollars uh, bailing out emergency bill. Uh, and then uh, Joe Stiglitz just uh, ironized. He said, a country that can spend more than 5 trillion US dollars to wage a war, I mean the, war, uh, the Iraq war, because he wrote a book about the, uh, the spending in all these uh, completely nonsense words in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And according to his calculus, the uh, United States might have spent more than 5 trillion US dollars for uh, a war uh, which does nothing, uh, or which has nothing of meaningful war for the United States. Uh, so uh, in countries that can spend 5 trillion US for US dollars to wage a war cannot afford to spend 700 billion US dollars to save its financial system. So it's really irony. Uh, uh, and now currently, the United States, uh, Biden, session continue to finance the war in Ukraine. Uh, recently, the US country just uh, made a bill to support more than 70 uh, billion US dollars to the Ukrainian government, to support the Ukrainian government to continue to fight. While uh, in the United States, they have a lot of broken bridge, dilapidated roads. They need a lot of investments in, in their domestic infrastructures. They don't have any money to spend on their domestic infrastructure construction while they can still to spend money abroad for completely nonsense wars. So that's really a, a odd, that, that's really a, a pity. How people should redress these kind of differences between the lack of investment in, in, in infrastructure building in, in, in mending those broken bridges and dilapidated roads uh, instead of uh, dilapidating money in those useless wars. So that's something. Those funny pictures have been found in Chinese newspaper to uh, the, the Han Paulson is begging Pelosi for these 700 billion uh, bill to save the US uh, financial system. And uh, the last part of my talk is about solving discord in other countries. There's, I think that's the modern version of uh, imperialist countries uh, of the old, uh, old way of divide and rule. Divide and rule used to be uh, imperialist countries practice in, in Africa, in Asia, in any other countries. Actually, today, in many countries of the world, the domestic conflicts in many countries, including in, in India, in Pakistan, in other countries, have been left by the colonialists. Because in the era of colonial powers, 
those imperialist countries use this divide and rule to try to maintain those regions under their control. And these uh, tactic of divide and rules have led to those conflicts among those ethnic groups in Ukraine. Uh, we know that in Ukraine, the Ukraine conflict has been also provoked by the incessant uh, efforts of uh, different US government to try to maintain, uh, to form some uh, protest movements. So uh, Victoria Newland have revealed in a conversation with uh, uh, EU officials, uh, he, he, she just complained about the uh, nudity, of, about the usefulness, uh, uselessness of the U European Union to support those opposition forces uh, in, in, in Ukraine. She just said that uh, the US has spent millions of dollars to support the Ukrainian protesting movement to topple down an elected government. Actually, the, the main thing revolution is a sort of color revolution that it, the, the US had conducted in many, many uh, Eastern European countries to topple down their legitimate power, legitimate elected uh, government. So they, they wanted to, to promote this kind of a revolution. And then we also, Li Jinping talked about Hong Kong uh, violence. Uh, Hong Kong riot. Uh, in Hong Kong, uh, also they did it, they did support separatist movements to create those kinds of riots. Uh, and they called those uh, uh, right movements, uh, the uh, civil society, uh, they did express to support all these to challenge legitimate Hong Kong authorities. So, and Nancy Pelosi said about called Hong Kong's right, a beautiful scenery in US television. We all know that. That's why when Donald Trump called people to, uh, to some violent behaviors at the US, uh, at the Washington's uh, Capitol Hill. So in China, we said, oh, he has been uh, retaliated by his own words. So uh, in, in Hong Kong, we have those kind of things. Uh, and then, yes, Li Jinping told also about these lies uh, about concentration uh, camps in Xinjiang. It's uh, really a, a ridiculous that in the United States or some Western country, those called uh, Christian countries, all of a sudden showed their concern about Muslim population in China. When in other part of, China, uh, uh, of this world, they are concerned about the clash of civilization. Uh, they are blaming those Muslim countries for their uh, support to so-called radical East, uh, Islamic movements, so on and so forth. So anyway, uh, remember that when uh, George Bush launched his uh, war on Iraq and called it, he, he, he called the uh, military, uh, military action a crusade, new crusade. So that's something reminds those uh, Christian countries that the conflict is coming between Muslim world uh, and uh, Christian world while talking about China. All of a sudden, those uh, Christian countries became so concerned about the fate of uh, Chinese Muslim population. So it, it becomes really a, a, a joke. And then uh, when we look at those uh, Muslim countries' attitude towards Xinjiang's problems, no Muslim countries is really uh, showed their anger about uh, Xinjiang. And on the contrary, we have invited some diplomats from the Western country, from Muslim countries to visit Xinjiang. When they came back, including Saudi diplomats, they said that, yes, we can, we can find a lot of inspiration from Chinese experience. Maybe we should learn some experience from Chinese practice then to implement in, the, the, in their 
domestic countries in their Muslim countries to try to stop the, the, the spread of uh, radicalist terrorist movement. So that's something very funny. The if you can wrap up, uh, Ifan, please. Yes, yes, please. I, I'm at the end of my, my, my talk. Uh, and recently, recently, some American diplomat met, had a private conversation with their guest in the uh, American consulate in China. And then those conversations have been leaked up to in the internet. And those people said that uh, they know that uh, what they said about Xinjiang is not true, it's a total lie. But they wanted to sow discord to instigate separatist movements in Xinjiang. So they recognized that uh, all this they talked about Xinjiang is a lie. So this kind of double-faced game about defending Taiwan, we know that President Joe Biden said, uh, by twinting his lung, <laughs> that the uh, uh, United States will defend Taiwan and so on and so forth. Uh, that's to support the separatist movement and, and, uh, in Taiwan and to check Chinese rights. But we're ready to, to take those cases seriously if really they want to continue to push the separatist movement in Taiwan to uh, support those separatist movements. Uh, we won't hesitate to take Taiwan over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. and so sorry for the conclusion for that we should mobilize social forces to unmask the logic behind the U.S. initiated wars and the proxy wars and the, and the protests against more wars in the world. Actually, our movements, our social movements are there to protest against, to unmask those kind of logic and to pro 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 protest against more wars in the world. Thank you. Uh, Th thank you, Yifang, and sorry for interrupting you. We just have to uh, keep a, an eye on the time because uh, mm -hmm. we have lots of other speakers. But but thank you for your wonderful remarks about well ab about dollar hegemony, about about propaganda, and and so on. They're really really very important, uh, or rather the lack of do do dollar hegemony, the tottering of do dollar hegemony, and the price it extracts from the United States itself. Okay, thank you. And we go on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Ben Norton. Ben is a journalist and founder of the independent media, alternative media platform, Multipolarista. He has reported from many countries, including Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia, Ecuador, Honduras, Colombia, and others. Ben is a regular and a favorite at many of the Friends of Socialist China and International uh, Manifesto Group webinars. So uh, uh, welcome, Ben, and uh, please take it away. Great. Can everyone hear me okay? Sorry, I'm just, I'm having an issue with my camera. One second. All right. Sorry about that. All right. I'll start. I'll go ahead and start. Um, I want to thank everyone who's participating. As always, these are very enlightening panels, and it's a real pleasure to be participating. Today, I'm going to talk about why the U.S. empire is so desperate to prevent the creation of a multipolar world and why multipolarity is necessary for socialism. And I, and I say this for a few reasons. One, there have been some socialist critiques of the idea of multipolarity, and I think they've been made in good faith, and I want to respond to them. The argument has been made that in the lead up to World War I, the, the world was a multipolar world. So the argument is, well, multipolarity and imperialism can still exist. And that's not wrong, but I think the situation today is extremely different. And, I, and I, there are a few fundamental reasons for that. One, multipolarity with a socialist pole within that multipolar system is fundamentally different from the multipolarity of the world leading up to World War I, which was a multipolarity of different colonialist powers. So it was not a multipolar, a genuine multipolarity in which there were countries of the global south that had independence and sovereignty. It was a multipolarity in which the European colonial powers had carved up the world and there was an inter-imperialist rivalry between them. The situation has been very different since the first socialist revolution in Russia, and especially since the socialist revolution in Cuba, and especially in China as well. 
th those three revolutions have fundamentally changed the character of imperialism. The Cuban revolution in Latin America, bringing in a new wave of socialism across Latin America. The Chinese revolution being after the, the Russian revolution, the first great socialist Marxist revolution and in a formerly colonized country that is also the largest country on the planet. So I'm gonna talk about the fundamental distinctions between those. But before that, I wanna talk really briefly about why socialism cannot exist without multipolarity, especially in the situation today, the global economic and political situation. We need to look at what unipolarity has been and understand that neoliberalism, the phase of capitalism that we've been living in for roughly 30 years or 40 years, is simply the phase of capitalism of the dictatorship of US imperial hegemony. It's not a coincidence that neoliberalism arose at the moment of decline and eventually overthrow of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc. Neoliberalism arose in the 1980s with the decline and crisis within the Soviet Union and the eventual overthrow. And in the 1990s, with the overthrow of the Eastern Bloc and the US-led capitalist bloc's victory in the first Cold War, we saw the triumph of neoliberalism in most countries around the world as an expression of the economic order of US imperialism and specifically US unipolar hegemony forcibly subordinating countries around the world. And it is nearly impossible to, to, to develop socialism in that situation of unipolar hegemony. We saw, of course, a few noble exceptions. Cuba did manage to survive through very difficult circumstances in the special period of the 1990s. The DPRK has survived despite the brutal blockade on it. And then, of course, China, the, the People's Republic of China was able to survive despite the coup attempt at Tiananmen, the color revolution attempt, and despite many other attacks. So they did manage to survive, but surviving is one thing, being able to thrive and develop the productive forces and develop your society and advance the cause of socialism is something completely different. And the situation has fundamentally changed since then, but in the 1990s with Francis Fukuyama and these sophists claiming the so-called end of history, and bourgeois liberal democracy with a neoliberal economic model being the supposed end of history, that represented the peak of US unipolar hegemony. And in those conditions, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to develop socialism. So we also need to look at the rise of socialism as being facilitated by a multipolar system. And if we go back to the first Cold War, we have to understand that the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China were absolutely indispensable in supporting national liberation movements around the global south. And this isn't in any way to, to discount and undermine the incredible importance of the national movements, the indigenous movements, the agency of people resisting imperialism and colonialism inside those countries. But let's keep in mind that for in the case of the Indian subcontinent, people were resisting British colonialism for nearly 200 years. And there were many brave revolutionaries, Bahagat Singh and countless others who sacrificed their lives, but they were ultimately unsuccessful in overthrowing the British Empire. Of course, in Algeria, there were many decades of revolutionaries who fought against the French Empire, but it wasn't until after World War II, the rise of the Soviet Union as a significant pull in what was essentially a bipolar system, but was not a unipolar system. It provided breathing room and material support, not just breathing room, but weapons, political support, diplomatic support, and economic support to national liberation struggles across Africa, in Angola, in Zimbabwe, in South Africa, in Latin America, in Cuba, and Nicaragua, in Asia, in Korea, and Vietnam. And of course, we, we can't understand the Korean revolution and the Vietnamese revolution and revolutions around the world without understanding the role of the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China in, in their material support for these revolutionary processes. So we need to understand again that multipolarity is what facilitated the rise of socialism in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s and the national liberation movements and decolonization movements. And in this sense, I think we have to have a, a kind of revision. Uh, I sh maybe I shouldn't have said the word revision because now, uh, you know, 
I'll be accused of being a revisionist, but uh, maybe a, a reinterpretation of the orthodox Marxist view in the 19th and early 20th century that revolution would inevitably take place within the imperial core. I think you know the majority of great Marxist thinkers going back to Marx and Engels themselves and many of their colleagues and successors in the 19th and early 20th centuries, they got almost everything right. They were correct about most things, but I think one of their fundamental misunderstandings or uh, one of the things that they simply uh, failed to, to keep into their calculation was that the vast majority of revolutions that have happened since then have been in the periphery, not been in the core. And there's, we can talk about why that is, and we can have an entire seminar about why that might be. But after the Russian Revolution, every other significant, you know, socialist revolution and national liberation struggle has been in in the periphery or the semi-periphery. You know, you could say Eastern Europe as well, Yugoslavia, but these are not countries deep in the imperial core. The idea that the revolution would take place in the imperial core in Germany and in the advanced industrialized capitalist nations. It didn't happen. And I, you know, there's a lot of reasons we could talk about that. But the reality is that even the Russian Revolution took place in the context of, yes, Tsarist Russia, which was an empire, but it was one of the weakest empires within the among the European colonial systems. You know, Lenin himself wrote an article about backward Russia advanced Asia. So, I mean, Russia itself, the Bolshevik movement was very much understood the backwardness of the Russian economy and political system when developing this, this socialist model. So I think we need to understand that significant historical detail and misunderstanding of early Orthodox Marxists. And, and that also, I think, really should enrich our understanding of the need for multipolarity for providing space and material support for socialist revolutions and socialist movements. Obviously, with the age of US unipolarity, we saw what the model was imposed economically. Countries in the global south that did achieve national liberation were faced with what Nkrumah called neocolonialism. South Africa is a great example of this. South, the people of South Africa, with support from the Soviet Union and other countries, they did manage to, uh, in, in an incredible struggle, achieve uh, legal equality under the law and abolish the apartheid system. But we saw that the ANC economically was forced to make massive concessions. Nelson Mandela was forced to make massive economic concessions and essentially adopt elements of a neoliberal model because they happened to succeed at the moment of US unipolarity. And they were not, they did not have the option of having other economic models. That was the Washington consensus. The IMF and the World Bank imposed that economic model on the world. And economist Michael Hudson has constantly stressed the importance of understanding neoliberalism being a particular form of economic finance capitalism that is related directly to U.S. foreign policy, to U.S. imperialism, forcibly subordinating economies so they can't be food sovereign. So they're forced to export their raw materials to the imperial core so they can't develop a local, you know, productive economy based on actual you know, a national bourgeoisie, it's all based on this parasitic comprador bourgeoisie. And finally, uh, I want to say, you know, so that with that analysis and that undergirding, why the US is so desperate to prevent the rise of a multipolar world. I mean, we see all around us right now, we see the, I would say the opening salvos of this new multipolar order. We see in Los Angeles, California, the disaster of the so-called summit of the Americas. We see that multiple countries in Latin America, their heads of state are boycotting the US organized summit, including the presidents of Venezuela, Cuba, uh, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. And we also see massive rebellions in the speeches given by leaders inside the summit. We see also that the Southern neighbor of the United States, which has a 3000 kilometer border, Mexico, and the U.S. and Mexico are both each other's most important trading partners. The president of Mexico, Andres Manuel López Obrador, has been openly criticizing the U.S. policies toward Latin America, openly condemning the U.S.-dominated organization of American states, calling for enriching the CELOC, the community of Latin American and Caribbean states, as an alternative, and condemning the U.S. blockade on Cuba, referring to it as a form of genocide. So these are historic developments. We also see that President Nicolas Maduro of Venezuela is right now, today's June 11th, 
He is in Iran, and he was also just visiting Algeria. And in a speech that he gave in Iran, Maduro talked about the importance of building a multipolar world, of building solidarity between Latin America and other parts of the global south, especially West Asia and North Africa and Algeria and Iran. We also see that Iran has proposed a new currency for trade among the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And I should stress that 40% of the world's population are represented by governments that are states within that are members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which represents roughly one third of global GDP. I'm talking about China, Russia, India, Pakistan, Iran just became a member in 2021, and the Central Asian Republics. And um, also Lula up. da Silva. I'm almost done. Lula da Silva, the former president of Brazil, who is leading all of the polls for the election this October, he has also call, called for creating a pan-Latin American currency to, quote, end dependency on the dollar, which he calls the sur, which means south. And we also see that even the Rand Corporation, which is funded by the U.S. military, published a study that was sponsored by the U.S. Air Force that lamentedly concluded that the U.S. can't force its Pacific allies of South Korea, Japan, Thailand, the Philippines, and Australia to install offensive intermediate range ballistic missile systems that the U.S. wants to surround China with. The U.S. military has an Indo-Pacific strategy, and it says it plans on spending more than $20 billion over five years, the next five years, to install a, an intermediate range ballistic missile system to threaten China with offensive weapons. These are not defensive, they're strictly offensive weapons. And the US wants to install these missile systems on the first island chain. It only has one small problem. Its allies refuse to accept these missile systems. So all of these signs, I think, are they are the beginning, the opening seeds of this new multipolar order. That is why the US government is so desperate to prevent the rise of a multipolar world. It understands that one, in order to maintain its economic hegemony around the world, in order for the US capitalist class to continue imposing neoliberalism around the world and exploiting the natural resources and labor of the global South, it must prevent the rise of multipolarity, especially multipolarity with a socialist pole led by the People's Republic of China. And then finally, we also see that the US strategy in order to prevent this multipolar world is instead in order to try to create a bipolar world. And this is the last thing I'll say, I, I swear I'm finished here. The US strategy is to, through a new cold war, to force countries around the world to pick a side in this new bipolar world as we saw in the first cold war. We see this with the economic iron curtain that the US and the EU have created, they created around Russia, telling countries that they can't do trade with Russia, threatening secondary sanctions on countries that do trade with Russia and saying essentially, as George Bush said, you're either with us or you're against us. And they are now threatening Taiwan. Joe Biden has made it very clear that the US government is willing to wage a war against the People's Republic of China in order to try to create a secessionist movement inside Taiwan, which is setting the stage for another war and an economic blockade of China, like the economic blockade of Russia, which is essentially creating a bipolar system. That is the US strategy to prevent the rise of a multipolar world. And it's the responsibility, I think, of all anti-imperialists and all socialists to talk about the importance of multipolarity against unipolarity in order to develop these socialist models that we've seen in, in China, in Cuba, in Venezuela, in Nicaragua, in Vietnam, and Laos. Because the US empire's ultimate goal as the leading capitalist power, which is the, the defender of capitalism, its goal is to prevent the rise of socialism around the world. And that's why it wants to maintain unipolarity to prevent socialism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. We could listen to you for much longer, but we do have to go on to the other speakers. I think your historical clarifications were very, very critical. And in particular, I think your, the, I think the, you, you, you emphasize the centrality of socialism to the evolution of the multipolar world. And I think you've done us a great service. Thank you very much. Our next speaker uh, has sent a, a recorded video. This is uh, Rob Kajiwara. Uh, Rob is an indigenous Okinawan activist. 
writer and musician. He is the founder and president of Peace for Okinawa Coalition, a nonprofit organization led by millennial Okinawans to promote Okinawan culture, history, language, and rights. From 2018-19, Kajiwara petitioned to stop the illegal construction of the US military base at uh, Henoko, Okinawa, receiving over 212,000 signatures. Kajiwara has represented uh, uh, Lukwans, Okinawa at the United Nations since 2019. So uh, we will now have uh, Rob's speech. Hi, I'm Robert Kajiwara, Indigenous Luchuan, also known as Okinawan or Uchinanchu, President of the Peace for Okinawa Coalition based in Okinawa City, dedicated to promoting Luchuan culture, history, language, and rights. Thank you very much to Carlos for inviting me to be here today speaking about imperialist aggression. Thank you as well to all of the other speakers. Unfortunately, imperialist aggression is a topic that Luchuans are all too familiar with. Before I continue, I should point out that this video contains images of graphic violence and warfare that may be disturbing to some viewers, so viewer discretion is advised. Since time immemorial, Okinawa was an independent nation known as Luchu, with its own unique culture, history, languages, values, and identity. Luchu maintained close, friendly relations with China, Korea, and Southeast Asia. Luchu prospered as a center of international trade, finance, and cross-cultural exchange, and was the chief facilitator of a large and highly influential maritime trade network that stretched throughout Asia. Luchu was highly respected by other peoples around the world, including Westerners, who marveled at how a small nation such as Luchu was able to build a prosperous society where poverty was virtually non-existent. During the 19th century, Luchu became recognized by the international community as an independent country via the signing of treaties with the United States, France, and the Netherlands. In 1879, Japan used its new modern Western-style military to invade and illegally annex Luchu. This would be the first of Japan's many imperialist conquests through World War II. As Japan began to lose the war, it deliberately placed an inordinate amount of military presence onto Okinawa Island with the intent of sacrificing Okinawans in order to protect the Japanese homeland. This resulted in the Battle of Okinawa in 1945, in which roughly one third of the indigenous Okinawan population was killed during a time span of just around three months. Japanese soldiers used the battle as a cover-up in order to deliberately murder Okinawan civilians, particularly those they caught speaking the native Okinawan language, as well as Luchu independence leaders. Japanese soldiers also used Okinawans as human shields and forcibly conscripted Okinawan civilians into the battlefield including women and children. After the war, most of Japan's other colonies regained their independence, but not Luchu. Instead, the United States decided to keep Luchu for itself to use for military bases. The United States military forcefully relocated thousands of Luchuans from their ancestral homes and imprisoned those who resisted in order to build these military bases. The United States also released convicted Japanese Class A war criminals such as Nobusuke Kishi because they believed he would lead Japan in a pro-America direction, which is exactly what he did. He would go on to become prime minister. Kishi's grandson, Shinzo Abe, continues the fascist legacy of his grandfather. He and numerous other Japanese politicians are continuously pushing Japan further into a right-wing, neoconservative, imperialist, and fascist direction. Not only are they trying to revive Japan's military strength, but they are also rewriting history, including Japan's textbooks, in order to cover up Japan's war crimes. For this reason, many of the younger generations in Japan today are completely unaware of Japan's dark 
past as an imperialist aggressor and are under the belief that Japan did nothing wrong. This is a grave concern for many Okinawans because although Okinawa makes up less than 1% of Japan's land area, it contains over 70% of Japan's military presence. Which of course means that Okinawa could once again very well be devastated in the event of a conflict. From 1945 through 1972, Lu Chu was under direct US military rule, which meant that it also missed out on the decades of economic growth that Japan experienced during the 50s and 60s. Lu Chuin strongly resisted being under US military rule, so in 1972, the US gave Lu Chu to Japan without a vote from Lu Chuin's in a move that is very much illegal under international law. And today, Lu Chu remains under joint occupation by both the United States and Japan, both of whom commit major human rights violations against indigenous Lu Chuin's on a daily basis. The military takes up around 15% of Okinawa's land and around 30% of its arable or best lands, but contributes only around 5% to Okinawa's economy, running at a huge deficit. This is of course a tremendous economic burden on the Okinawan people, many of whom are forced to work two or three jobs just to get by. Okinawa maintains a very high child poverty rate at around 25%. The U.S. military commits numerous crimes against Okinawan civilians, particularly violent crime against women and children. The United States military is also responsible for tremendous environmental destruction in Okinawa, including the current construction of another U.S. military base in the northern part of Okinawa at a location called Hinoko. The base's construction is destroying an ancient coral reef home to hundreds of rare and endangered species, including the Okinawa dugong. In February 2019, the Okinawan people held a referendum in which the overwhelming majority voted against the construction of this base, and yet both the United States and Japan governments simply ignored the referendum and are continuing to build the base anyway. To make matters worse, the U.S. military has also poisoned Okinawa's water with cancer-causing chemicals, forcing thousands of Okinawans to buy bottled water. The U.S. and Japan governments claim that this heavy military presence is necessary in order to protect Okinawans from China. However, very few people believe that, and even the U.S. government has privately admitted that Okinawans do not see China as a threat. We know this via WikiLeaks, and it was published in the Wall Street Journal. I've done several videos in the past talking about Okinawa's relationship with China. Please check those out if you are interested in learning more. I will, however, say that China and Okinawa have always had very positive, friendly, and mutually beneficial relations. This dates back even to ancient times. China has never once harmed Okinawa or Luchu in any way, and actually China has helped Luchu in many ways. Whereas Japan tries to rewrite history and tries to cover up Luchu's glorious past as an independent nation, China has rightfully acknowledged Lu Chu's history, and even recently at the United Nations, China played an instrumental role in helping pass a resolution that is being referred to as the Legacies of Colonialism. This resolution is very important and is being applauded by Lu Chuans and other oppressed peoples around the world who have experienced the harmful impact of Western imperialism. So, no, China is not a threat to Luchu, Hawaii, Guam, or any other nation in the Pacific. Rather, China offers an opportunity at multipolarity, an opportunity to expand our business, trade, and cross-cultural relations in mutually beneficial ways. This is what I and many others believe we should be doing not only with China, but with many other nations around the world. 
this is how we can build a more peaceful and prosperous society for us all. I'm just about out of time for today, so I'll end here. To learn more or to find ways you can help support us, please visit our website, peaceforokinawa.org. We do accept donations. We also sell merchandise, the proceeds of which go to help us fund our mission of promoting Okinawan culture, history, languages, and rights. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Uh, thank you to Rob for his really uh, absolutely fascinating video. Uh, and I hope others will uh, also check out his website. Um, our next speaker is Jenny Clegg. Jenny is an academic peace activist and long-term China specialist. She wrote a PhD on China's peasants in the revolution and was award, which was awarded by the University of Manchester in 1989 and will be published as a book later this year by Praxis Press. She's also written much else besides and her previous book was China's Global Strategy Towards a Multipolar World. So Jenny, we look forward to hearing uh, your views and your expertise. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Radhika, for that introduction. I'm very pleased to be joining this panel. Um, I'm going to be starting with a quote uh, from Tony Blair, believe it or not, not my favourite person, of course. Um, shortly after 9-11, he said in a speech, the kaleidoscope has been shaken, the pieces are in flux. Before they settle again, let's reorder the world around us. It seems to me that this is a particularly apt description for what is going on at present around the Ukraine crisis. Um, of course, it was after 9-11 that Bush stepped up to seize the multipolar moment, but instead this was to founder with the inevitable advance of a multipolar world. From a pattern of one dominant superpower with four major powers, uh, the EU, Japan, Russia, China, over the next 20 years, um, we saw a more even five power balance, particularly with the rise of China, which endeavoured then to draw the EU and Japan in through the Belt and Road Initiative. With the US struggling to maintain its dominant position, it began to shift towards a strategy of China containment. And the Ukraine crisis is now the catalyst speeding up long term trends. The NATO 2030 report, which was issued last year, uh, set out the agenda, Russia first, then China. Now Blinken and Biden have made absolutely clear for the US support for Ukraine is not just about European security, it's part of an epic global battle against so-called autocracy. This moral crusade is unfolding in a multi-pronged strategy which is dividing and destabilizing the world. Firstly, there's the renewal and reinforcing of the original NATO project, to keep Germany down, Russia out and the US in, and now drawing NATO allies and partners closer together, extending its reach across Europe into Asia, bringing them all together in a 40 country strong coalition committed to the weapons and sanctions approach aiming at breaking Russia. Secondly, the crisis is being used to overcome any remaining resistance to militarization. Both Germany and Japan, the former Axis powers, are remilitarizing. Uh, then there's the end of the ending of the long-standing non-alignment in Finland and Sweden. And before this, the arms control system suffered a serious blow with the ending of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty in 2019. The third prong of the strategy is the creation of a new rules-based order in which only democracies would be deemed legitimate, which is aimed at undermining the UN and ending the one China policy. Now we see the US seeking to provoke China over Taiwan as it did Russia over Ukraine, ignoring the fact that whilst Ukraine is a sovereign state, Taiwan is a part of China. And of course, Taiwan is strategically placed at the center of the chain of US military bases, uh, which reach from Japan, obviously through Okinawa, all the way down to Australia, uh, which are aiming to block China off from the Pacific and prevent it from playing a full role in the region to which it belongs. UN recognition of Taiwan as a part of China is the main obstacle to US isolation of China from the world and a new rules-based order would allow recognition of a democratic Taiwan as a sovereign independent state. 
Now, from the vantage point of my country, Britain, uh, which lies at the heart of nuclear armed NATO, uh, it's clear to see the full global uh, potential of the US NATO China containment strategy stretching out like a python to squeeze at the key channels of China's growing, growing influence. First, there's AUKUS. Uh, Britain, of course, is a member of this. Um, and this uh, AUKUS is building Australia up as a massive forward base for the US military, as well as a nuclear submarine base. In this way, uh, it will serve as the southern anchor of the Pacific chain of military bases uh, that I mentioned before, blocking off the maritime route of China's Belt and Road Initiative. Secondly, the land route of the BRI across Eurasia may well be contained by a new Japan-Germany military partnership. Nuclear weapons backup is to come from the US base at Lakenheath in Suffolk, where we're seeing the return of US nuclear warheads to our soil. Uh, this base at Lakenheath will enable the flexible and efficient deployment of nuclear weapons across Europe. Then finally, a couple of weeks ago, we had a surprise appearance of US and French nuclear submarines at our nuclear base at Faslane in Scotland, raising the prospect of a new NATO nuclear base as a jumping off point to the Arctic, no doubt linked in a new NATO presence uh, in Finland and Sweden. This all less China open up a new trade route as the ice cap melts. So in other words, under the cover of the Ukraine crisis, long-term plans to cut off China's key land and sea routes are unfolding at a rapid rate as it gains and strengthens its military links under the NATO umbrella. So the empire is indeed turning the kaleidoscope to disorganize the five power pattern seizing the moment to crush Russia and isolate China and to subject Europe and Japan to a new US military hegemony, whilst also seeking to head off any newly emerging poles of power, for example, by endeavoring to incorporate India. Boxing off Russia and China together, the aim is to recenter as much of the rest of the world as possible around the US, around the US which is restored in power through the revival of its military and fossil fuels industries and its weaponization of finance. So I would argue that the target of this uh, division or bifurcation is actually to finish off the UN. However, instead of a division between so-called democracies and autocracies, what we see is a deepening divide between the West and the rest. The large number of abstentions on UN motions to condemn and isolate Russia, the widespread reluctance to apply sanctions, the cool responses to Biden's diplomatic overtures has generated new talk of a non-aligned movement. But first of all, we need to consider why countries in the global south are increasingly reluctant to follow US leadership. And there are many reasons at play, but to what extent are these shaping up into a coherent, non-aligned opposition? So first of all, why this disaffection? Well, the chaotic departure of NATO from Afghanistan, for one, and the unreliable nature of the US political system and its foreign policy for another. Then, of course, the shock of US weaponization of finance um, if the US is able to block Russia from the world financial system, uh, it could easily do so to others who might not wish to conform to US policies. The US says every country is free to choose, but its moral crusade is really a coerced alignment which restricts other countries' national serenity. And added to this are real fears of being caught like Ukraine in a proxy war as the US announces plans to push Russia and China out of Latin America, Africa, uh, the Caribbean, as well as dividing Asia. And then, of course, there's the rising prices of food and energy. The last straw on top of COVID, climate change, poverty and debt in the failure of the world as it currently op operates under US-led institutions to work to support the needs of developing countries. A new non-aligned movement, however, needs to go beyond saying no. The world disorder is of such a scale as to demand not only a complete renewal of UN principles for the sake of peace, but a completely new arrangement of world institutions, as well as an alternative to the uh, US dollar-based financial system. 
Faced with this massive agenda, it is sobering to think that the combined economies of the 20 top developing countries, including China, is just half that of the combined economic weight of the top 20 developed countries. Even as US, the US superpower has weakened over recent decades, the third world or global south has become less united, fragmented between the BRICS, the emerging economies, the large developing economies, and the impoverished least developing ones. And there's been an absence of coordination to promote development. Within the BRICS, there's been a tendency to advance their own regional power and status, the idea of multipolarity conflating with a kind of big power chauvinism, uh, to which I would argue Putin fell prey in ordering the invasion of Ukraine. A multipolar agenda has to transcend power rivalries. Nation states have to challenge uh, populist factionalism and look to end neoliberal short-termism and instead encourage longer-term state planning for development, building on regional complementarities and South-South cooperation. At the core of the struggle uh, in the world um, is the race to the frontiers of the fourth industrial revolution, redistributing the new industries, high-tech industries, renewable energy and so on, from the global north to the global south. And this could provide the basis for the change of the global financial system. So we need to strategize. We need to make a sober assessment of strengths and weaknesses, distinguishing between objective conditions and subjective consciousness. We need to clearly differentiate between multipolarity, anti-imperialism and counter-hegemony. A counter-hegemonic strategy would exploit contradictions between the imperialist powers uh, in order to head off world division. China, for its part, is urging Europe to strengthen its strategic autonomy whilst integrating Japan into the framework of the regional comprehensive economic partnership. At the same time, it is advancing a double proposal the Global Development Initiative to counter the decoupling trend and the Global Security Initiative to counter a new Cold War division. And these, to my mind, offer a starting place for a fragmented Global South to move forwards towards long-term world transformation. As Mao said, a thousandly march starts with a single step. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jenny. That was really great. I think a uh, fantastic and highly informed set of reflections on the disorder that capitalism creates at home as well as abroad and the order that a socialist type of multilateralism and, and, and multipolarity must try to bring and that China is doing contributing so much to, to, to creating. So thank you very much. Um, uh, our next speaker uh, is also on a recorded video. Mustafa Haider Sayed is executive director of Pakistan China Institute and a graduate of Peking University. He is involved in producing research, conducting bilateral and multilateral dialogues, and giving policy recommendations in partnership with Pakistani, Chinese, and regional stakeholders. He's a leading expert on China Pakistan relations and the China Pakistan Economic Corridor. So we'll have a short video of his now. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Dajahao. Uh, greetings from Pakistan and the Pakistan China Institute. On the very outset, I would like to thank and compliment the Friends of Socialist China for continuing to foster dialogue that challenges conventional mainstream narratives that are propagated for narrow political interests and bringing together a galaxy of speakers from different corners of the world to discuss these important issues that affect our nations, countries, people, and uh, livelihoods. As we know, the biggest conflict of recent history, which is taking place uh, in Europe, is that between Russia and Ukraine. And this is viewed by the West, by the United States and its allies, as a inflection point of us versus them, where Russia and China are viewed as authoritarian uh, countries 
who are challenging the status quo and their deep entrenched interests, political, economic and military of NATO, the EU and the United States. We are seeing the containment, confrontation of the peaceful rise of China, which has risen through soft power, which has risen through economic might and is actually the only uh, contemporary power in history that has not used military might to rise. And if you see other countries like the United Kingdom and how it flexed its muscles, invaded countries, the East India Company, Pakistan and our subcontinent is what they took over and they ruled including uh, you know uh, other areas apart from the South, South Asia. In the United States uh, has risen through military might. France of course and other powers in the West. So China we see rising through economic growth, through very carefully crafted economic diplomacy in the form of the Belt and Road Initiative, which has offered an alternative to developing countries that were exclusively in the past dependent on IMF and the World Bank programs. And then the BRI has also been uh, criticized through propaganda that it is inflicting countries with debt. And there was a very good article in the Atlantic, the uh, Washington based think tank, how the US, uh, the debt, the Chinese debt trap is a myth, was the name of the article. So, countries in uh, BRI who have leading projects like Pakistan have not experienced any debt from China. And the debt from China is about $6 billion of our total portfolio of the China-Pakistan economic corridor, which is, as we speak, over 34 to $35 billion. The rest of it is FDIs, foreign direct investments, grants, concessional uh, financing. So why demonize China? Because if they cannot afford, they do not want to see China as replacing the United States as the biggest economic power because that alters the status quo and the problem is rather than just competing with China which would have been some good and healthy competition they want to confront China and demonize China like they did with Iran George Bush painted it out to be uh, part of this axis of evil this so-called axis of evil Iraq, where they said there's weapons of mass destruction, so it was demonized, so action in US taxpayers' money could be spent justifiably to attack it through various means. And we can see that the red lines between China and the US are being blurred because Taiwan is a case in point. There is uh, no reflection of the US's one. Uh, China policy. Speaker Nancy Pelosi is supposed to visit Taiwan at any moment and they are treating Taiwan as an independent sovereign country that is a contravention and contradictory to the one China, long-standing one China policy that the US has had in the past and there seems to be a departure from that which blurs those red lines in which both countries should be and have been operating in the past. And furthermore, the Indo-Pacific strategy of the United States that we, that we see lists and the latest updated one was released by the White House in uh, February of 2022 this year, which lists China, the United States and uh, Russia as the two major adversaries of the United States and its allies. If you look at NATO in 2030, which is the uh, goals and vision of the NATO for the year of 2030, it lists China as a challenge, which is intriguing because China is north, not in the North Atlantic and NATO is a 
group of North Atlantic countries, apparently. But China is listed. So we see the Orca squad, uh, you know, uh, to be a grouping in, uh, of uh, countries in Asia. Uh, we see a NATO like organization being created in Asia. Then you have, of course, NATO itself. So we see these, this consistent pattern of block politics that is being created to counter China. But is it working? If you just look at last Thursday, last week when the US hosted the first ever US ASEAN special summit, which was hosted in the White House, all ASEAN leaders were there. And the biggest elephant in the room was China because the South China Sea, which is uh, also contested uh, between Asian countries and the East China Sea lies within ASEAN. And it's also a very important strategic trade route. And we saw that there were a lot of references to the U.S.'s Indo-Pacific strategy in the readout that was released by the White House. And we saw that the summit was being used to advance the Indo-Pacific strategy by leveraging U.S.'s interests and relationships in ASEAN. And what a concerning uh, uh, point that I saw in that was that the Coast Guard of the United States is going to be now heavily stationed in ASEAN countries. So security naval uh, affiliates of the United States, of maritime security apparatus, will be there that will, I think, cause more tension and insecurity rather than calm the region because that will cause more polarization in countries which are talking to each other to resolve disputes because the United States will only fan the fire, the presence of the Coast Guard, rather than dousing the fire. So we see that the US's strategy in engaging with China is not based on a carefully charted, defined area where they can compete, engage, and uh, uh, confront in a diplomatic way. But it is a more of a lens and prism of containment. It's a, a strategy of isolating and trying to corner China. And it is not working. If you just look at ASEAN, ASEAN has joined all of the ASEAN countries, a part of the BRI, the Batumbo Initiative, which has about 165 signatories. If you just look at uh, the AIIB, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, a lot of the ASEAN countries and the United Kingdom and, the, and Australia, uh, a lot of, a lot of quad, quad and AUKUS members are part of the AIIB. And the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, which was a mammoth agreement, uh, which in which China was a key driving force, the largest free trade agreement to date in world history is very much uh, uh, game changer for ASEAN. So, what does the US see benefiting it so far? Has its strategy worked? No, it hasn't. Is it going to work? No, it will not. If you look at uh, the book Dealing with China by the former uh, US Secretary of Treasury, uh, Paul Hansen. He uh, very uh, wisely articulates of U.S. and Washington engage with China because based on U.S. interests, because he says that U.S. interests will be advanced by engaging with Beijing because a lot of top U.S. companies like Apple, Ford, uh, <clears throat> Boeing are huge uh, dependent economically on the Chinese market and earn mammoth profits by working and engaging in China. And in fact, Kishore Mahubani in his book, Has China Won, states that once upon a time, the biggest lobbyist for engaging and working with China was the Amer China American Chamber of Commerce, the Chamber of Commerce of the US. Uh, in the US, which was dealing with China and engaging with China because they had so much intertwined and still have businesses 
and supply chains and it's a win-win partnership. So I think that the Biden administration has actually compounded this what Trump began vis-a-vis China. And I think that there has to be a more nuanced strategy to deal with Beijing, a strategy which understands their culture, their history, their sensitivities, the hundred years of uh, century of humiliation, and that China will not tolerate this behavior anymore. It is not the same China that it was 20 years ago. This is a more assertive, sovereign, independent China that is not willing to take it lying down. And nor are the friends of the world, not friends of China or the United States, friend, friends of globalization. They're not willing to pick sides as we see today. Thank you very much. And I look forward that we can have an in-person conclave in the future. And hopefully the Pakistan China Institute can take an opportunity in the future to host all of you in collaboration with the Friends of China, uh, Friends of uh, Socialist China uh, in the near future in Pakistan. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Mustafa Haider Syed. And uh, I would just, before we go on to our final four speakers, I just like to say two things. Number one, sorry for being a slightly lax chair, but I think the fantastic contributions that have come in are to blame. I just had very little heart, even when I did sometimes ask people to wrap up, to really interrupt people. So um, I will uh, simply ask people to bear in mind to try to keep their presentations to about 12 minutes. Um, and also, secondly, I don't think we'll have time for questions and answers. So if you have questions, please feel free to share them both in the Q&A and in the chat. At least people can discuss these questions, be aware of them. And also perhaps some of the speakers may contribute in the chat and respond to your questions. So having said that, I will go to the next speaker. Chris uh, Matlako is the second De Deputy General Secretary of the South African Communist Party in addition to being General Secretary of the Friends of Cuba Society South Africa and an executive member of the World Peace Congress. Chris is also very much a regular at our meetings and he always has wonderful and very interesting things to say. So please go ahead, Chris. Uh, <clears throat> no, thank you very much, uh, Radhika. My, let me apologize, my, my bandwidth is not stable. So if you, I mean, through your permission, if you allow me to switch off the camera so that uh, my presentation is not interrupted, uh, I will do so uh, <clears throat> and go straight there. <clears throat> well, yes, uh, in acknowledging the contribution that has been made by those who spoke before us, uh, I mean, I think important uh, aspects have also been touched upon elaborated and uh, also put into a very good uh, context. Therefore, in this brief presentation, uh, we will share with you some rough thoughts on the subject based on our analysis of various events over the last decades or so. These events are important to consider and link to what is unraveling today as we move yet again into an epoch of crises of significant proportions for the globe, and especially the majority, it's poor women and children. <clears throat> the globe today faces interrelated crises of a global economic crisis and its systemic failures, an ecological and geopolitical crisis. In the immediate aftermath of the end of the defeat of Hitler's uh, Nazi Germany, the United States military dominance and hegemony took off in a big way, as it has been alluded, as it began to provide significant military supplies and other assistance to its allies by 1940, even though it did not enter the war until 1941. Much of this aid uh, was to the United Kingdom and other nations already at war with Germany and Japan through what it called land lease program. This allowed it to build up its military and consolidate the military industrial complex in the US. This also allowed the US, uh, apologies. This also allowed the US over the years to become the leading and strongest military nation on the globe. Uh, and with such a politics of hegemony 
and unilateralism. Throughout this period, US imperialism was able to dominate and compel the globe towards a unilateral global outlook through its military coercion and its long history of wars against the globe, which has resulted in destructions of infrastructure, hunger, poverty, and total subjugation of large parts of the globe in what the US politician came to call uh, democracy. With the decline of the US economic capabilities and the rise of other nations across the globe, and the financial economic crisis of 2008-2009 uh, in particular, the US began to consider a change of tact, which was imperative since amongst others, the decolonization period, the massive popular uprising of peoples across the globe that propelled the globe to take a closer look at the agendas of the US. The heavy losses it suffered in wars such as in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, and in an earlier period, especially in Latin America, the US resorted to a hybrid war of propping up dictators, stirring instability, delegitimizing of elected leaders, color revolution, and the brutal assassination of popular leaders who were articulating different trajectory of development for their countries and peoples. The hybrid war was also sustained through a strong public opinion manipulation project. As pointed out by Li Jing, the extensive use of social media, where journalists and editors were bought to plant and advance certain perspectives in the major uh, uh, stories uh, in the world press. Today, in the context of Russia's strategic incursion into uh, the, the Ukraine earlier this year, the US and imperialism finds itself in the corner, despite its best effort to try and extricate itself from the crisis. The unilateral raft of sanctions and other financial instruments seeking to punish Russia and those who don't agree with it, it through Russia's concert, uh, consistent effort, have found a way around sanctions and financial transactions in the world. In this context, imperialism, as we have come to discover in the global South and in Africa in particular, has for long periods been trying to lure others behind its campaign under the guise of democracy and development aid. Recently, Zambia agreed to host the strategic intelligence facility of the United States military on its territory, ostensibly to try and cajole Southern African region after the failure of Africon and a consistent principal opposition to US imperialism, including the development in the Northern part of uh, Mozambique. In Mali and against other ECOWAS nations in the region, the military regime there kicked out France and its so-called peacekeeping forces in its territory. The Malian military has opted to strengthen ties, trade and other relations with Russia and Turkey. There are nominal efforts beginning to emerge across the globe, seeking to undermine the US and its allies' hegemony and unilateralism, in particular in uh, social media and propaganda spaces. Both Russia and China have developed extensive platforms on social media and financial transactional platforms to continue to enable international exchange and trade. We in South Africa are keenly aware of the so-called color revolutions. In the aftermath of the United Nations no-fly zone position, which allowed France and the UK and the US and its allies to kill Muammar Gaddafi and plant Libya into the chaos that it is today, plunging the living standards of ordinary Libyans into the abyss. We are particularly aware and have been impacted upon in a major way when a Polish national who had migrated to our country, harboring anti-communist and pro-Nazi attitudes, brutally assassinated the general secretary of the South African Communist Party, Comrade Chris Tembisile Hani, in 1991. 
Yanuz Walus, who had emigrated to South Africa earlier, harbored strong anti communist sentiments, which we argue were cultivated during the period of Lech Walesa's Labour Party's anti Soviet campaign in the late 80s, confirming this orientation and supported. Uh, by the United States, Waleha, among other things, said the following, I quote, there's a need for remodeling of democracy and capitalism. And he's also reported to have said, we have been worried that the remodeling will not get done without the substantial participation of the United States. Close quote. According to him, the growing absence of the U.S., as a global force in recent years uh, has left the void of ideas and leadership that populist figures in various nations have sought to fill with appeals for nostalgia and xenophobia, he is reported to have said. Indeed, this is our left history and experience of anti-communism, neo-Nazism, racism, and fascism which the apartheid regime also modeled itself around. He and his ilk in the conservative circles, both here and elsewhere around the globe, had wanted to plunge our country into a civil war with devastating consequences for all, so that the glimmer of freedom be dimmed and the majority of the black population to continue to be subjugated under the yoke of colonialism of a special time. What we see taking place in the Ukraine has a similar familiarity to it. Anti-communism, neo-Nazism, racism, raciophobia. And when we recognize the impeccable role played by the Soviet people and its government in our struggles for national liberation, it is waved away and said to be nostalgic. Indeed, we are nostalgic if that means defending the national aspirations and the goals that we have achieved as a nation. We believe our best efforts to confront imperialism and its antecedent belligerence is to properly articulate in what the International Manifesto Group says, I quote, today, however, the struggle stands at the perilous juncture, close quote. Notwithstanding our deep and massive contradictions, in the left and elsewhere in progressive circles. Through pluripolarity to socialism should be our broad slogan that encompasses our anti-imperialism principle and campaign. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Granica. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. I think we've just been very enriched by the perspective that you have shared, which is that of one of the most venerable national liberation movements and movements for progressive social change that, that we have in the world. So thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Juhyun Park. Uh, Juhyun is a writer who organizes with the No Dut Dol uh, for, the, for Korean Community Development. Nodu Dol was founded in 1999 as an organization for, uh, for first through fourth generation Korean Americans. Nodu Dol organizes for a world free of imperialism and for Korea's reunification and national liberation. So, Ju Hyun, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Radhika. It's great to be back here with all of you. Uh, my name is Ju Hyun, and I am with Nodu Dol for Korean Community Development. As other comrades have addressed, the rise of multipolarity is creating new fault lines and deepening existing ones around the world. Today, I wanna to talk about one of those fault lines, which is Korea, a country that has now been divided for 77 years. Earlier this week on Sunday, the DPRK or the Democratic People's Republic of Korea tested eight ballistic missiles off of Korea's East Coast. The next day, the United States and South Korea responded by firing eight missiles of their own into the sea. This is just the latest exchange in over a year of escalating tensions. The capitalist press is already hard at work portraying North Korea as an irrational nuclear aggressor, and the State Department is raising the alarm over the possibility of another nuclear test from North Korea later this year, which would be its first since 2017. 
Yet the roots of Korea's so-called nuclear crisis, which I prefer to call a crisis of national division, lie in US diplomatic obstruction, South Korean militarization, and of course, the long unfinished Korean War. As US power declines and a multipolar order dawns, there are new perils and new opportunities arising in Korea that have wider implications for the region and the overall direction of the world system. So over the past year, a new arms race has been playing out in Korea. The situation has been building for some time and South Korea's role in it with the backing of the US needs to be explained. South Korea's previous president, Moon Jae-in, was probably best known internationally for pushing diplomacy with North Korea, but he was also a defense hawk, like every liberal South Korean president has been before him. So while preaching about the need for dialogue, Moon also increased South Korea's defense budget by 30% to $54 billion a year. While calling on the United States to declare an end to the Korean War, he struck deals with US companies like SpaceX to build a South Korean space force. And while wagging his finger at North Korea's weapons tests, Moon tested South Korea's first submarine launched ballistic missiles and also put the military on track to acquire nuclear submarines and build a Korean version of Israel's Iron Dome. Now, Yoon Seok Yeol, the new conservative president, has only worsened matters. Just one month into office, Yoon has held a summit with Biden, attended working group sessions of the Quad, an anti-China military alliance between Japan, the United States, India, and Australia. He has pledged to resume annual joint military exercises with the United States. These are war drills where tens of thousands of troops at a time simulate invasions of North Korea, just a few miles from the DMZ. And he has also strongly touted South Korea's so-called kill chain doctrine, a military plan to decapitate the North Korean leadership with a preemptive strike in the event of a suspected attack. All of this is why North Korea has conducted 18 missile tests this year. South Korea's military advances have changed the balance of forces and the North has to respond. North Korea's artillery cannot reach South Korea's missiles if they are being launched from submarines. And with nuclear submarines and a space force, South Korea's military will have a much wider global reach, making it a more potent asset for the US and emboldening imperialist aggression. To counter this, North Korea has developed missiles that can be launched from mobile platforms to undermine South Korea's kill chain doctrine. They've also successfully tested hypersonic missiles that can evade most US missile shields and strike any of the US's military bases in Japan. The state of affairs is a sharp pivot from recent history. It was just a few years ago that North Korea and the US under Trump met in Hanoi and Singapore for high level talks. These talks led nowhere. North Korea has always maintained that it is open to taking steps to denuclearize in exchange for binding security agreements and relief from the worst of US sanctions. The United States has always rejected this proposal and Trump was no different. This is because the US is not interested in negotiations. It wants a full surrender. This reality didn't change when Biden took office, so North Korea is back to weapons testing because the US has slammed the door to diplomacy in its face and is now fueling the South in the arms race. Since 2017, North Korea has honored a moratorium on nuclear weapons testing, and if a nuclear wep uh, weapons test happens later this year, it will be a sign of how badly the US squandered the last opportunity for dialogue. As multipolarity rises, the US's interests in keeping Korea divided and subordinated are only intensifying. The US military considers Korea part of its forward line of defense, 6,000 miles away from the mainland. The largest US military base outside of North America sits in Pyeongtaek, South Korea. The US stations 28,000 troops in the South and basically externalizes many of its military costs, including civil violence and environmental destruction onto Korea and its people. For decades, the United States imposed restrictions on South Korea's ability to develop its Navy or build missiles. But in recent years, those restrictions have been relaxed, which is helping to drive the new arms race. This is partially motivated by the fact that the South Korean military serves under the command of the United States in wartime. The South Korean army has 600,000 active duty troops at any given moment. In the past, limiting South Korea's military capabilities helped to keep it dependent on the US for defense. But today, expanding South Korean military power is a way of bulking up the US position. As potential flashpoints with China multiply across the Pacific from Taiwan to the Solomon Islands, we can expect the United States will do everything in its power to deploy South Korean naval and ground troops to its side in the event of a war. This has long been the US security equation in Northeast Asia. 
The U.S. provides air power and dollars. Japan provides bases, mostly in occupied Okinawa. And South Korea provides the cannon fodder. It is not an accident that out of these three countries, only South Korea has compulsory military service, while for decades, Japan, officially at least, had no military at all. So without Korea, the basis of U.S. power in the Pacific would be seriously compromised. And that is why the U.S. will not accept reunification unless it is the South absorbing a collapsed and defeated North. Korean sovereignty cannot coexist with U.S. imperialism. So South Korea is crucial to U.S. Uh, tech supply chains as a producer of semiconductors and as a major captive market for U.S. and Japanese business. <clears throat> And finally, the status quo of permanent division and war provides a good rationale for the wider deployment of US troops in the Pacific to encircle Asia's rising powers. Multipolarity is on the other hand, also producing contradictions that could undermine US power in Korea in the long term. China became South Korea's top trade partner almost 20 years ago. Contradictions are growing between US imperialism and the Korean national bourgeoisie. This is another factor driving this arms race. Military independence is increasingly seen in some circles as a necessary investment against US decline. Ultimately, US hopes of decoupling South Korea from China are probably a fantasy because China, I'm sorry, because South Korea simply has too much to lose from doing that. In the short term, the reactionary Yoon government will cement the neo-colonial US-South Korea relationship. But after that, the US's ability to hold this relationship together through economics alone is in serious doubt. The failure of Biden's recent launch, launch of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is one indication of this. But one solution to, the long -term to this long-term problem for the United States is war and the preparation for war. Now, of course, Korea's bourgeoisie is not the only source of contradiction with imperialism, nor is it the most important one. For the moment, South Korea's left is fractured and in retreat, but the workers' movement remains organized and militant, and the objective conditions for its resurgence exist. The 25,000 member truckers union in South Korea just went on strike this week over rising fuel prices. Since the 90s, neoliberalism has reduced almost half of South Koreans to the status of precarious workers and created overlapping crises in housing, education, healthcare, and beyond. A generation has grown up in formal bourgeois democracy to find that their personal hopes are stifled by capitalism and their country's destiny is still chained to imperialism. The failures of the Moon administration have disillusioned many people. And there are powerful worker, peasant, student, and progressive movements that exist in our advancing class struggle, uh, although there is a need to work towards establishing a broader unity. Where South Korea's working masses go from here will shape the entire peninsula's future. This era is also creating opportunities for North Korea. Recently, Russia and China vetoed a UN Security Council resolution to impose new sanctions on the DPRK. This is a first for both countries and a very welcome development. As international trade in rubles and renminbi become more common, especially in the context of the Ukraine war, North Korea may be able to expand international trade and further develop its productive forces. These are great prospects, but the time scale is uncertain, and North Koreans know from history they cannot depend on others for their own freedom. This is why military defense remains a priority, because it is the most assured and immediate means of realizing and protecting North Korean independence. What we can say for certain is the revolutionary Korean project will endure. U.S. prophecies of collapse have proven to be quite hollow. Under socialism, the people of Northern Korea have rebuilt from war. They have endured and returned from the fall of the Eastern Bloc when a combination of the U.S. blockade and environmental disaster reversed decades of developmental gains almost overnight. They are still striving to improve their standard of living every day in the face of endless U.S. aggression. On the other hand, under capitalism, the people of the United States have only looked to look forward to endless war, pandemic, mass killings, incarceration, debt, and instability. So we'll see which society collapses first. Now, the transition to a multipolar world does not mean the end of imperialism by itself, but twists and turns in the world system do mean epochal changes for individual countries. With Korea, it was the transition to a world imperialist system in the 19th century that reduced our country from an independent kingdom to a colony of Japan. It was the catastrophic rise of the United States in the 20th century as the world's dominant imperial power that tore Korea in half and provoked a war that killed 4 million of our people, a war that still has not ended. And since the 90s, unipolarity has meant IMF structural adjustment and neoliberalism unleashed in South Korea, and it has meant brutal siege tactics against the North in all, at its most vulnerable moments since the Korean War. 
Today, the rise of multipolarity is creating new opportunities for North Korea, complicating the South's relationship to the US and making imperialism more desperate to keep Korea divided, occupied and controlled. A socialist pluripolarity that ruptures the US imperialist system could create openings for peace, reunification and sovereignty in Korea, but this is not guaranteed to be an easy road. War is the final card in the US's hand to reverse the tide of history. And there is very little chance that Korea could escape such a war. The United States will try to drag South Korea in wherever the conflict begins, and the North will not sit on its hands while the US wreaks havoc in its neighborhood. We can hope that the combined military capacities of China and North Korea can sufficiently deter the United States, but ultimately defeating imperialism is everyone's responsibility. It was the Palestinian revolutionary Hassan Kanafani who taught us, imperialism has laid its body over the world, the head in Eastern Asia, the heart in the Middle East, its arteries reaching Africa and Latin America. Wherever you strike it, you damage it and you serve the world revolution. So we must do everything we can to strike at imperialism from wherever we are and carry forward the torch of revolution. Everywhere we must strike as if the world depends on it because it does. And we must strike as if we can really win because we can. The United States is swimming against the tide of history and it is up to us to be the wave pushing towards the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Ju Hyun, I'm sorry, I'm not saying your name properly, but my 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 mistake. But anyway, I, I thought that was a really excellent overview, uh, connecting also, I think, the centrality of uh, uh, class struggles within countries to the future of the multipolar order. And of course, the centrality of the division of the Korean Peninsula to the regional balance of power. I think it was absolutely fascinating. Many things that um, I hadn't thought about, which you made me think about. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is Sarah Flounders. Sarah is a US-based political writer who has been active in the progressive and anti-war organizing since the 1960s. She's a leading member of the Workers' World Party, a contributing editor of Workers World newspaper and co-director of the International Action Center founded by Ramsey Clark. She's co-author and editor of 10 books on US wars and military policy. Sarah has organized solidarity delegations to Iraq during the years of the starvation sanctions. She has traveled to Sudan after the US bombing there and to Yugoslavia during the US NATO war. She has helped to organize and participated in solidarity delegations to Syria, Iran, Lebanon, Palestine, Cuba, and China, all countries that have been sanctioned by the US government. She's an organizer of the sanctions kill campaign, opposing all US sanctions as crimes against humanity. She's a founder and organizer of the United Anti National Anti-War Coalition and the National Board of the National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedoms. She works on legal defense efforts for uh, Afia Siddiqui uh, and Mumia Abu-Jamal and many other political prisoners in the United States. So Sarah, we are really keen to hear your thoughts. Please go ahead. Thank you. And I want to start by thanking the Friends of Socialist China for organizing this incredible discussion today. And all Friends of Socialist China, I think, are excited to learn about the announcement of China-Cuba filing for joint patent for a pan-corona vaccine. This new vaccine, a collaboration between the biotech sectors of the two countries, is a first patent for a single vaccine effective against the many variants of COVID-19. Today, we're talking imperialism's global war. So we need to address why US imperialism is so threatened by such exciting developments. Capitalism, by its very nature, is driven to compete and to maximize profit. It's unable to cooperate. It exploits its own working class every minute and the whole world ruthlessly. The three most successful makers of the COVID vaccine are making combined profits of $1,000 a second. It's in their stockholders' profit interest to be secretive and competitive. They're not capable of accomplishing what China is able to do, or even what Cuba, with 1% the population of China, are able to do through intense cooperation and people-centered planning. 
Cuba sends more medical personnel to Africa than the World Health Organization. There's also joint efforts to develop innovative treatments for diseases like cancer, diabetes, hepatitis. Cuba and China's practical cooperation has extended to fields of agriculture, neuroscience, nanosciences, climate change, natural resources, and the environment. It's capitalism's drive to maximize profit every quarter. That means that the, the structure, the system has no structure capable of overall long-term planning, just ruthless competition. Now, just how far is the US government willing to go in the protection of corporate profits and the control of patents, which is ruthlessly enforced? U.S. trade officials announced that the government will veto a global plan to allow countries to temporarily ignore patents to make their own COVID vaccines. The U.S. said they'll block an international agreement if China is not excluded from the pact. Now, China is the world's largest provider of COVID-19 vaccines. They've provided over 2 billion doses to more than 120 countries, the majority developing countries. China is providing the technology for countries to manufacture their own vaccines and is helping develop partnerships in manufacturing. This breaks the monopoly of the US and the European Union. And this is why China is targeted by US imperialism. US imperialism is the defender of corporate power in a unipolar world. Now, this weekend was, is Biden's Summit of the Americas. It's a complete farce, despite the promise of new economic partnership with Latin America. The majority of the countries of the Western Hemisphere announced that they'll not attend because sanctioned Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua are uninvited. There's a people summit in Los Angeles, a worker summit in Tijuana that feature the countries who are excluded by Biden's threadbare summit. It's an amazing development in Washington's own backyard, as they call it, to reject a US invitation. Why? China has become one of the most important commercial partners for many Latin American countries. This growing cooperation cannot be reversed by a photo op summit. The U.S. share of global manufacturing activity has declined drastically. What can U.S. corporations offer except threats, coups, and weapon sales? According to U.N. trade data, China has already overtaken the U.S. and most of Latin American countries throughout Asia and Africa. Now, let's look at the heaviest sanctions ever imposed. U.S. government strategists are using the sanctions on Russia and on China as a wrecking ball in a global economy. It's a desperate struggle to preserve their global hegemony in a unipolar world. It's a policy of consciously demolishing supply chains of essential products. It's a reckless war on defenseless civilian populations. It sends shockwaves far beyond the countries that are directly targeted. All this is well understood. But for the first time, this intentional disruption is rebounding against the countries imposing the sanctions. It's a boomerang effect. This crime against humanity has come back and hit the European Union and British and US imperialism with a vengeance. There's unprecedented inflation, highest in 40 years, supply chain chaos, higher costs for energy, and an erosion of dollar supremacy, the bedrock of economic hegemony. It's economic interests that drive nation states to war. And there's a futile attempt to break US imperialism's slipping, slipping economic position that's what's driven NATO's massive involvement in the Ukraine. For four decades, corporate interests in the G7 top economies have applauded and pushed globalization because they were in control of the process, especially the US. 
They're, it's their dominant position in the IMF, the World Bank, in the World Trade Organization. It assured this control. But now the Chinese economy is surpassing the U.S. in total production, well over a trillion dollars in Belt and Road development programs. China's a more attractive trading partner. And this growing integration of EU trade and investment with Russia and China challenges the domination of corporate power. Now, why is Russia particularly targeted right now? The Russian economy is much smaller than the US. The, the economy is smaller than Canada or South Korea. Russia's defense budget is one twelfth US military spending and a tiny fraction of the entire NATO military alliance. But while Russia has neither military or economic threat, it has enormous natural resources that are presently out of US control and that makes Russia a target. The immediate threat to US hegemony was that EU trade with Russia at 260 billion a year, 10 times their trade with US. The EU is the largest investor in Russia. And European trade with China is also, it's overtaken by far its trade with the US at 230 billion. So there's, there's this breaking, it's how to break this economic integration of the EU with Russia and at a greater level with China, that is a desperate gamble to protect US corporate domination. President Joe Biden confidently promised that the US and EU sanctions would have a catastrophic impact on Russia's economy. US analysts predicted Russian bank and stock market collapse, hyperinflation, soaring prices, supply chain disruptions, empty shelves, massive unemployment, but what happened was the end of dollar diplomacy. So with short-sighted arrogance, the U.S. cut Russia from the swift banking system of payments and trade. Visa and MasterCharge shut down overnight, but it didn't create the predicted chaos. The Central Bank of, of Russia was able to switch to the China SIPS uh, network, which includes 3,000 banking installations institutions in 167 countries. SIPS was able to seamlessly process credit card transactions and swift banking transactions cut by the US sanctions meant that Europe was unable to pay for Russian gas and oil. Russia's response was, we'll continue the contracts in gas and oil, same rates, but you'll pay us in rubles, the Russian currency. Accepting payment in Russian rubles and not allowing countries, and at the same time, allowing countries not enforcing sanctions to pay in Chinese yuan, rupee, and other currencies meant that both the dollar and the euro were no longer the currency for major trade transactions. The result is the Russian ruble has rebounded while the US dollar, and especially the euro, have been sinking. Forgotten in all the congratulatory declarations was that throughout the developing world, there was no agreement on these US imposed measures. The resistance of China, the world's largest economy to US demands to comply with the sanctions on Russia has given other nations the confidence that they too could survive U.S. demands and still have access to development funds, to essential technology, to trade. India, South Africa, Brazil, the BRICS country, along with almost all the countries of Africa, Latin America, most Asian countries, refuse to stop trade with Russia against their own interests. The open defiance of so many countries and major trading blocks is a stunning confirmation of the weakening hold of US economic power. Developing countries are actually strengthening their economic coordination in order to withstand the subsequent shocks caused by Western sanctions. It's no longer secretive trade. This is now open exchanges. China is meeting with their banks to discuss how to protect China's overseas assets from deeper next round of US sanctions, and they are coming. Now, in 
China's GDP is roughly 10 times larger than Russia. So consider sanctions there. China is the world's top trading economy, the number one exporter of manufactured goods. Every US plan for sanctions on China starts with a manufactured crisis over Taiwan. In violation of 40 years of past agreements with China on Taiwan, Washington is rapidly increasing all of its military aid to Taiwan. That $40 billion package to Ukraine is just the first step in widely expanding military threats. It's a super profit fix to sinking US economy. All the US strategists admit that sanctions and military confrontation with China will be massively dis disruptive on a world scale. But that prediction does nothing to slow US preparation. So we need to prepare for greater conflict and to applaud, support, and build for deeper cooperation among all the resisting forces. I thank you for today's webinar because it's part of that cooperation, that spirit of resistance uh, in the face of what will be greater conflict. Thank you so much, Sarah. I think you, you, you speak with such authority and I think uh, knowledge and information about the latest developments, including things like the China-Cuba uh, uh, vaccine, which really is a telling comment on the um, so-called technology, high technological abilities of the West. I mean, it really is stunning. Um, so if we go to our final speaker now, uh, I thank everyone for the incredible patience and the interest that they have shown. Uh, so our final speaker is Danny Haifong. Danny is a socialist activist and journalist. He serves as contributing editor of Black Agenda Report, is co-founder of the No Cold War campaign, and is co-editor of the Friends of Socialist China uh, a website, which is, of course, the organizer of today's panel. Uh, Danny has also co-authored the book American Exceptionalism and American Innocence, A People's History of Fake News from the Revolutionary War to the War on Terror. So Danny, I think you're a very fitting speaker to bring this uh, event to a close, being connected with both, um, well, the ideological war, which is so prominent, and of course, with Friends of Socialist China. Go ahead. Thanks so much, Radhika, for the introduction. And thanks, everyone, for attending this event. It has been an incredible event, talking about all the different connections to multipolarity and how we need to understand this moment. My talk will focus on multipolarity as an expression of class struggle. And to begin, I want to say just in the post-Soviet era, it has become fashionable to strip all geopolitical developments of their class roots. Wars have been explained away by bourgeois propaganda, the war on terror, great power competition, and matters of quote-unquote national security. The Ukraine crisis is a case in point. Russia's military operation in Ukraine has been labeled a war without a cause by Western detractors. But underneath the cacophony of capitalist ideology and propaganda is a class struggle occurring on a global stage for multipolarity, where the Russia-Ukraine conflict is but one flashpoint. Vladimir Lenin is perhaps the most well-known Marxist revolutionary to advance a modern theory of international relations rooted in the class struggle brought about by imperialism. Lenin concluded that the ascendancy of monopoly and finance capital divided the world into colonies and oppressed nations. The self-determination of these nations would therefore form a core pillar in the struggle for socialism worldwide. Without self-determination, workers and oppressed people of the world would suffer immeasurable losses from the scourge of colonial domination and its triple evils of military occupation, economic plunder, and racial discrimination. Multipolarity is in essence a continuation of the struggle for self-determination in the modern era. After years of imperialist ramblings about the end of history and there is no alternative to neoliberalism, the trend toward a multipolar world is demonstrating that the exact opposite is true. In all corners of the globe, the unipolar dominance of US imperialism is collapsing upon its own contradictions. In Europe, 
U.S. imperialism threatens to shut the lights out and place what was once the center of capitalist development into a permanent state of decay. In Latin America, insurgent left-wing governments led by Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia, and others are rejecting U.S. domination in their pursuit of people-centered de socialist development and integration. In Africa, Western plunder and militarization led by the U.S. has led many countries to pursue stronger relations with China and Russia. China and Russia are in the vanguard of the multipolar world. China's socialist governance system has balanced entrance into an unstable, capitalist-dominated world economic system by maintaining state control of the commanding heights of the economy, such as land, energy, transportation, natural resources, and finance. This has allowed China to ascend to the top of the economic ladder as a top innovator of high technology and address socialist imperatives, such as poverty, climate change, and public health. Russia has dug its way out of the disastrous collapse of the Soviet Union to regain national sovereignty and become a major economic and military power in rapid time. While many differences exist between Russia and China, what binds them is a commitment to sovereign development and self-determination. China and Russia's alliance has included steadfast resistance to US and Western sanctions against not just their societies, but also smaller countries in the global South, like the DPRK, Cuba, and Syria. China and Russia have led efforts to seek peaceful re resolutions where the US only makes war. While the US has applied force in its policy towards Syria, Ukraine, and the DPRK to name just a few, China and Russia have positioned themselves as anchors for peace on the UN Security Council and several other multilateral organizations. These include the BRICS, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and the infrastructure projects of the Belt and Road Initiative in the Eurasian Economic Union, both of which offer cooperative pathways to economic integration and development. These efforts on the part of Russia and China arguably form the foundations of multipolarity. But what is a multipolar world exactly? It is a world where multiple systems of development exist, sometimes in contradiction and conflict with each other, other times in cooperation. Some have viewed this development in abstract terms, stripping multipolarity of its class character. This is a monumental error. Multipolarity is not a benign development, but an outgrowth of class struggle. U.S. imperialism's war against multipolarity is a war on self-determination and sovereignty. To U.S. imperialism, unity among the oppressed nations of the world is the foremost enemy to the unipolar dominance required to maximize capitalist profit. Thwarting such unity is the principal reason why the U.S. has militarily encircled both Russia and China and placed sanctions on key components of their economies. It is why Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela suffer under starvation sanctions, and leftist movements throughout Latin America have been undermined for seeking collective liberation from the U.S.'s Monroe Doctrine. Furthermore, the U.S.'s militarization of Africa via the U.S. Africa Command is intimately linked to the U.S. NATO war on Libya in 2011, a nation that has had as a central goal the integration of the resource-rich African continent through an independent currency, military, and passport system. U.S. wars in West and Central Asia cannot be separated from the class struggle embodied in multipolarity either. These wars have one goal, to keep the region in chaos. Chaos holds the possibility that integration projects such as the China-led Belt and Road Initiative will be arrested in this key part of the world. The U.S. war on Syria and its continued destabilization campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan, for example, are part of an attempt to block Russia and China's vision for the integration of the region from east to west. Massive hunger, death, and terrorism that have resulted from these wars are merely collateral damage in the larger goal of thwarting genuine independence and self-determination. Now, some may wonder in this intense new Cold War environment whether Russia can seriously be considered a champion of self-determination and sovereignty. After all, the Ukraine crisis has been portrayed by the West as an unquestionable example of Russian aggression that violates international law. Let's be clear, Russia's special military operation in Ukraine does not contradict the central premise 
that multipolarity is rooted in class struggle. U.S. NATO encroachments along Russia's border since 1991 and the U.S.-backed coup in Ukraine in 2014 created an untenable security situation. Rather than contradict Russia's role in the multipolar world system, the Ukraine crisis has strengthened it by demonstrating just how enormous the stakes of this class struggle truly are. The Ukraine crisis has exposed how the U.S.'s war on multipolarity threatens to bring about a global war even more destructive than the prior two global conflicts of the 20th century, fought among the capitalists for the domination of the planet. By waging ceaseless counterinsurgency war maneuvers meant to provoke Russia and China, the U.S. empire is playing with fire. This is evident in the U.S.'s complete refusal to negotiate with Russia in December of 2021 to prevent the Ukraine crisis from escalating and its increased military expenditures to both Ukraine and Taiwan over this same period. U.S. imperialism has been the instigator of war and violator of self-determination all along, but it is the wall-to-wall -wall misinformation of the Western corporate media, which has convinced many in North America and Europe to believe otherwise. U.S. imperialism clearly views multipolarity, not from the prism of peaceful coexistence, but as a threat to its continued rule of a financial empire. Progressive and left forces in the West should too. Multipolarity is indeed a class struggle, one characterized by nations and peoples pursuing peaceful, sovereign, and people-centered development in the face of a hegemon willing to use the deadliest forms of economic, political, and military warfare to stop them. The question becomes, which side are we on? The side of the imperialists led by the United States seeking maximum profit for the fewest people and nations, or that of China, Russia, and its allies striving for self-determination and integration in an effort to meet the needs of the people and the planet. Our collective answer will determine whether progressive forces in the West continue to stand by and watch the war on multipolarity unfold, or whether they're organized to follow Lenin's advice and take up the struggle to defeat their own imperialist governments at the root of this problem. Thanks so much, everyone, for attending this event. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you so much, Danny. I, again, you brought the, the, uh, the uh, event very suitably to a close by, by taking us back to some of the fundamentals of, of multipolarity, why it's important, why it's a matter of classes struggling as well as nations struggling, and, uh, and how it's, it, it's really an outcome of, of the oppression produced by capitalism. I just want to bring these remarks to a uh, this session to a close now by thanking all the speakers who have given amazing food for thought. I think we haven't had um, we haven't had anything like this. I mean, we, we, we have had an extremely high quality conversation. Um, I would also like to thank the audience for hanging on. We've also had uh, over 75 people watching on YouTube. I've put the link in the chat. Please share the uh, link to this uh, to this uh, video webinar to, to many other places. I would like to thank the Friends of Socialist China for organizing this. And please note that uh, the links for Friends of Socialist China have been shared on in the chat. So uh, there are links to the website. Please check it out. If you like what you, you heard here, you will love what's on there. Similarly, uh, Carlos has shared the links for the International Manifesto Group website. And I very much urge you to consider taking a look there, reading the manifesto, and uh, perhaps consider signing it. Uh, in both cases, Friends of Socialist China and IMG also perhaps consider donating, etc. Really what we've learned today on, on this uh, whole panel on multipolarity is that we really face a choice and we have to make our choices now because the time to make those choices is now. The choices are between unity and conflict among humanity, between order and chaos in our societies, between progress and decline, between development and imperialism, and ultimately between peace and war. So uh, thank you very much again. And on behalf of Friends of Socialist China, I thank everyone, speakers and audience for being here. Bye bye. Radhika, don't turn it off because people said they want to save the chat. So okay. leave it for five minutes. Well, I, will, I will leave it on for five minutes so people can save the chat. Which you can do with the three dots at the bottom right of the 